Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jose Romero. Um, I'm calling to order the um, February meeting of the ACIP. If I had a gavel, you would hear that better, but I don't. Um, and so um, on behalf of myself and our executive secretary, Amanda Cohn, I welcome you to today's meeting, the first of two days um, for February. Um, I will now turn it over to uh, Amanda, Dr. Cohn, uh, for comments. Thank you very much. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, next slide. And apologies, the, the ACIP meeting is not February 25th through 25th. It is uh, 24th through 25th. Um, this is our regular uh, ACIP non-COVID, non-emergency, non-pop-up uh, meeting. Um, and we welcome you today. Um, we have a full and busy agenda. Before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the enormous amount of work that has been done over really the last year during um, this pandemic uh, by the ACIP team, specifically uh, by our deputy, uh, Jessica McNeil, um, who uh, has really just um, led ACIP uh, and continued to do make sure our important work was done uh, in spite of all of the other priorities um, and has done it with such grace. I also wanted to thank uh, Stephanie Thomas, Chris Carraway, and Natalie Green. Uh, Stephanie um, continues to be uh, an amazing committee specialist, and um, I know we frequently acknowledge them all in person, um, but uh, I just wanted to do it virtually uh, this time. Next slide. So copies of the slides being presented at uh, today's meeting are available on the ACIP website. Um, additionally, they're available through a share file link for ACIP voting liaison and ex officio members. Um, videos of the live webcast will be posted on the ACIP website approximately one week after meet the meeting, and the meeting minutes will also be posted on the ACIP website generally within 90 to 120 days of the meeting. Next slide. We ask for all of you who are uh, listening to today's meeting on the Zoom webcast that you mute your lines at all times until you're called on for discussion. Uh, when Dr. Romero opens the meeting for discussion, please virtually raise your hand. During the discussion period, Dr. Romero will first take questions from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison members. Um, please uh, disable uh, your video, uh, except for uh, the voting members will enable their video uh, during uh, the vote scheduled uh, for today. Um, just some uh, awareness about upcoming uh, meeting dates. Uh, we do have an emergency ACIP meeting scheduled for February 28th and March 1st, and um, I just also want to acknowledge that we have not only um, the 15 voting ACIP members, but also um, dozens of ex officios and liaison members and people who tune in regularly to support ACIP who will be in these meetings uh, for, I believe, uh, 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 four out of the next six days. So thank you. Um, and I know VERPAC is a day long meeting in between there. So um, uh, stay with us and we'll make sure we take uh, breaks during the next several days. Um, we also have regularly scheduled ACIP meetings. June 23rd to 20, June 24th is our next one. Uh, we do not know at this point if this will be virtual or um, in person. It uh, could be partially uh, in person, uh, which would just mean the ACIP voting members attend in person, uh, but it is most likely to be virtual. Next slide. I am going to hand it over to Dr. Romero now. Um, we didn't, um, we haven't had an opportunity to uh, thank our outgoing ACIP members uh, who are joining us this morning. And so, uh, Dr. Romero, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. So, um, Dr. Robert Atmar will be leaving, has left us, um, and uh, is uh, making a cameo appearance today along with uh, the other two members that uh, have left. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what they've done here. And then um, after we talked about each of them, we'll have them uh, offer a few words if they wish. So uh, Dr. Atmar, uh, he was chair of the Influenza Work Group, chair of the Dengue Work Group, chair of the RSV uh, Adult Work Group, uh, and a co-chair of the RSV Pediatric work, work Group. 
Um, he may have rivaled uh, Art Reingold for the number of chairs that uh, he held. Uh, those of you that have been on the ACIP for a while know that uh, Dr. Uh, Reingold is, is the holder of the most chairs uh, in, in history, I think, for the ACIP. Um, he's also a member of the anthrax group, the Ebola group, and the Flavi virus group. Um, and um, let me just say that uh, the, the thing that I remember most about uh, Bob is that um, he would walk to our dinner meetings, uh, no matter how far away they were. <laughs> so um, uh, he would uh, be two or three miles or so uh, and make it there on time. Um, so uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Dr. Paul Hunter. Uh, he was chair of the uh, Adult Immunization Schedule Work Group, chair of the uh, General Best Practices Work Group, um, Evidence-Based uh, uh, Recommendations Work Group, member, member of the Mumps Work Group, member of the Pertussis Work Group, and uh, member of the Pneumococcal Work Group. Um, and um, I uh, have very fond memories of Paul um, in that he counseled me and uh, gave me very sage advice um, as I um, as I morphed into my uh, probably third career. Um, so again, thank you, Paul. Um, next, we have Dr. Peter Salaji. Uh, so uh, Dr. Salaji was chair of the HPV uh, work group, uh, co-chair of the RSV uh, pediatric work group, uh, member of the child adolescent uh, immunization schedule work group, uh, member of the work groups for influenza, RSV, adult work group, and a COVID-19 uh, work group. Um, and uh, Peter, the thing I, I think I, I, I relish the most and enjoy the most was your calm demeanor, uh, your thoughtfulness, um, and uh, you were always there to ask the, the most appropriate question at that moment. So um, I will stop here, um, and uh, if uh, anyone would like to go first and, and offer any comments, please do. And if you're willing to put on your video, that would also be great, but totally up to you all. Dr. Atmar? Sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time on the ACIP. It was one of the major joys and privileges of my professional career. Um, the members of the committee are so knowledgeable and talented, and the CDC personnel are so dedicated and committed to improving public health, in addition to being so very capable at uh, what they do so well. So I, I want to um, thank uh, those on the committee and, and, and the CDC for allowing me to uh, participate to, in this, uh, on this committee over the last uh, four and a half years or so. It's been an honor. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Hunter? Thanks. Serving on the ACIP from uh, 2016 to 2020 has been the most fulfilling activity of my career. One of my first ACIP votes was to decrease the number of HPV shots uh, if the first dose is given before age 15 years. I was happy to protect more children against cancer by making uh, uh, completing an effective vaccination series more likely. I was also glad to see such implementation issues be incorporated into ACIP deliberations via the evidence to recommendations process. Participating in work groups and ACIP meetings has been the most educational experience of my career. I learned uh, perhaps the most on the uh, pneumococcal work group including how vaccinating children with co um, conjugate vaccines prevents invasive pneumococcal disease in adults. I also want to thank the hardworking CDC staff who faced so many challenges during my four-year term, yet remained focused and hopeful. I especially thank my fellow ACIP members for their insight, humor, and for challenging me to grow professionally. I'm proud to have been a small part of a group that continues to lead the way towards preventing disease through the compassionate and well-reasoned application of scientific evidence. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunter. Um, uh, last but not least, Dr. Salaji. Thank you, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Romero. 
uh, for such a nice tribute. I just want to echo uh, what Drs. Atmar and Huntra said um, and, and tell you that this has been one of the greatest honors of my career. Um, in, in my opinion, I think ACIP's careful evidence-based process, which includes so much the work groups toward recommendations and guidelines should be a role model for decision-making across our country. And I think it could be a prototype for many other organizations. I want to personally thank the ACIP voting members, the liaisons, the CDC experts for your incredible knowledge and passion for preventing disease and for serving our country. In my opinion, public health is the backbone of our nation's healthcare system as is so evident during the pandemic, and it's been a true honor and privilege to serve on ACIP, so thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Um, I, I just want to add that um, all three of you, as you can tell, not only from the number of work groups you have all chaired and participated in, but um, y'all went way above and beyond, as have all the voting members, um, anything uh, the CDC staff could have expected in terms of your commitment um, with this additional six months of service um, during incredibly challenging times. All of us have uh, personal challenges, work challenges, and um, of course, ACIP has been challenging. Um, but we, um, we our, our staff are committed because we have such um, amazing ACIP members, and um, the three of you uh, will be missed. Uh, and uh, we hope one day soon we can uh, thank you in person. Next slide. So today there will be a public comment session uh, before the scheduled vote. Um, we uh, are, at its heart, a public body, and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes is uh, key. Uh, so this public comment, the oral public comment period will be this afternoon. It will occur at approximately 12.30 p.m. And um, individuals were selected for public comment uh, through a random selection of those who uh, requested to uh, give public comment um, on the ACIP public comment registration site. Uh, I want to remind everybody that members of the public can also submit written public comments via regulations.gov uh, using docket number for this meeting, CDC 2021-0008. Um, information on the written public comment process, including information about how to make a comment, can be found at ACIP's website. Um, on the ACIP website right now, we actually have um, two public docket two public comment doc dockets open on regulations.gov. And um, we do ask that you make sure to link to the meeting uh, that your comment uh, refers to. Next slide. As noted in the ACIP Policies and Procedures Manual, members of the ACIP agreed to forego uh, participation in certain activities related to um, vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests, um, uh, members do receive a limited conflict of interest waiver. Um, however, any individual that uh, either acts on a data safety monitoring board or, or uh, is a, an investigator on a clinical trial for any product uh, will, recuse, will recuse themselves from votes related to that product or any product that that company um, uh, develops. Um, at the beginning of each ACIP meeting and uh, at the time of any vote, ACIP members will state their conflicts of interest. Next slide. Uh, we actually have our ACIP membership nominations open uh, again. Um, this is for candidates to fill upcoming vacancies on the ACIP. Detailed instructions um, are available now on the ACIP website. Uh, this is a uh, membership, is, is nominations, and people can self-nominate, are due no later than July 1st, 2021. This is for a four-year term beginning in July 2022. Um, so we appreciate people reaching out um, and um, uh, recommending people to be members and uh, share with your colleagues. Um, and with that, um, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Romero to get the uh, meeting started. Thank you, everyone. 
Very good. So um, we'll start by taking roll. Um, and um, when I call your name, um, please um, state your uh, affiliation and whether you have any conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, I'll begin with myself. I'm Jose Romero. I am the Arkansas uh, S uh, Secretary of Health. Um, I'm also a professor of pediatrics, pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I have no conflicts. Uh, Dr. Alt, please. My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Kansas Hospital in Kansas City, Kansas. I have no conflict. Thank you. Welcome. Ms. Bata. Good morning. Lynn Bata with the, uh, with the Minnesota Department of Health. I function as the immunization consultant, and I have no conflict. Good morning. Welcome. Dr. Bell. Sorry, um, this is, excuse me, Beth Bell. Uh, I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington, um, and I have no conflict. Welcome, thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Uh, we'll come back to Dr. Bernstein. Um, Dr. Chen, please. Wilbur Chen, Professor of Medicine at the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I have grant support with Emergent, uh, the manufacturer of the cholera vaccine, to be discussed during this meeting. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Dr. Daly. Uh, good morning. Uh, Matt Daly. I'm a senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and also an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I have no conflict. Good morning and welcome to the committee. Dr. Fry. Good morning. This is Sharon Fry. I'm a professor of internal medicine at St. Louis University and am an adult infectious disease specialist. I also serve as the clinical director for the St. Louis University Center for Vaccine Development. I have no conflicts related to this particular meeting, but do serve as a principal investigator on several uh, COVID vaccine trials. Good morning and welcome. Dr. Cotton. Camille Cotton. I am the clinical director of transplant infectious disease and immunocompromised host group at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And until last week, I served on a DSMB for a pneumococcal vaccine, but I have resigned from that position, so I have no current conflict. Good morning and welcome to the committee. Dr. Lee. Grace Lee, Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, Associate CMO for Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Dr. Long. Dr. Long. We'll come back to Dr. Long. Uh, Ms. McNally. Good morning. Veronica McNally with the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflict. Good morning and welcome. Uh, Dr. Paling. Good morning. This is Kathy Paling. I'm professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, serve as director of pediatric population health, and I have no complex. Welcome. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Roberto. I'm Pablo Sanchez, I'm professor of pediatrics um, in the divisions of neonatology and pediatric infectious diseases at Nationwide Children's New Ohio State University, and I have no complex. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Talbot. Technical difficulties. Good morning. I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor at um, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, let me go back to Dr. Bernstein. Good morning. My name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. 
and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Um, Dr. Long, please. Dr. Long? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and take her um, affiliation and um, conflict of interest, if any, um, when she joins. Um, I will now turn it back to uh, Dr. Cohen. Okay, forgive me. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the ex officio members. I'm just going to call your, um, your uh, institution and move forward. So, um, the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare Services. Good morning. This is Mary Beth Hans. Food and Drug Administration. Hi, good morning, George. Thanks for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Excellence. Welcome, both of you. Uh, Health Resources and Services Administration. Good morning. This is Mary Rubin for the Division of Injury Compensation Programs, HRSA. Good morning. Welcome. Indian Health Services. Good morning. This is Thomas Weiser for Indian Health Service. Good morning. Uh, Office of Infectious Disease, HIV, AIDS Policy. Good morning. David Kim, OIDP. Good morning. National Institutes of Health. Yeah, good morning. John Bargo, National Institute of Allergy Infectious Disease. Good morning. Now moving on to liaison representatives. Again, I will call your um, uh, organization and please state your name. Uh, American Academy of Family Physicians. Pamela Rockwell, AAFP, present. Good morning, welcome. American Academy of Pediatrics. Good morning, Bonnie Maldonado, uh, Chair, Committee on Infectious Diseases, American Academy of Pediatrics. Welcome and good morning. American Academy of Pediatrics, Red Book Editor. David Kimberlin, uh, AAP Red Book. Welcome, good morning. American Academy of Physician Assistants. I'm sorry, there's some problem with my connectivity. Uh, Marie Michelle Leger, AAPA, Director of Clinical Education. Good morning and welcome. American College of Health, Asso uh, American College Health Association. Judy Tai with UNC Chapel Hill and Sarah McMullen from Cornell University. Welcome. American College of Health Association uh, alternate. Okay, we'll move on. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. American College of uh, Nurse Midwives alternate. We'll move on. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. This is Dr. Linda Eckert present? Thank you. Good morning and welcome. American College of Physicians. Jason Goldman, affiliate professor, FAU, Florida. American College of Physicians present. Thank you. Good morning. American Geriatric Society. Hench Mater for AGS. Good morning. America's Health Insurance Plans. Uh, uh, Bob Gluckman, Chief Medical Officer, Providence Health Plans uh, for AHIP. Thank you. Welcome and good morning. American Immunization Registry Association. American Immunization Registry Association. All right, we'll come back to that. Uh, American Medical Association. Sandra Freihofer, practicing general internist in Atlanta, adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory, and liaison for the American Medical Association. Good morning and welcome. American Nurses Association. I'm Chad Riddle, representing the ANA president. Welcome, good morning. American Osteopathic Association. Dan Grog, and I'm present. Thank you, welcome. American Pharmacists Association. Good morning, everyone. This is Steve Foster. Good morning. Association of Immunization Managers. Hey, everyone. Molly Howell, representing AIM and North Dakota Department of Health. Welcome. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. 
This is Paul McKinney, Professor, School of Public Health and Information Sciences, University of Louisville. <clears throat> Welcome. Association of State and Territorial Officials. Association of State and Territorial Officials. We'll come back. Biotechnology Industry Organization. Sorry, I couldn't get up and eat. Phil is Arthur, present for bio. Good morning and welcome. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Yeah, Dr. Christine Hahn from Idaho, representing CSTE. Good morning, welcome. Uh, alternate for Co Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Okay. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. We'll come back. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Carol Baker for IDSA. Welcome and good morning. International Society for Travel Medicine. Elizabeth Barnett for the ISTM, present. Good morning, welcome. National Association of County and City Health Officials. Good morning, Matt Zahn, representing NATO, present. Welcome and good morning. National Association of County and City Health uh, 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 Officials alternate. Okay. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Okay. Um, we'll come back. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Bill Schaffner on behalf of the NFID. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Uh, National Medical Association. Good morning. Pat Whitley Williams on behalf of the National Medical Association. Welcome and good morning. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Uh, Sean O'Leary, present. Good morning, welcome. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society alternate. Okay, move on to the next one. Research, uh, sorry, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Welcome and good morning. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Good morning, it's Amy Middleman representing SAM. Good morning, and Society for Health, uh, sorry, Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Good morning, Marcy Dries representing Shea. Welcome and good morning. Let me go back. Um, American Immunization Registry Association. Okay, next, uh, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. All right, um, last, uh, National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Okay. And now I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Messonnier. Actually, just Nancy Messonnier, CDC. Thank you. Dr. Messonnier. All right. Um, with that, role has been taken. Dr. Cohen. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are ready to jump into our agenda with a uh, rabies vaccine. Um, so we are pulling up the slides, but uh, Dr. Sharon Frey, who is our work group chair for this committee, will get started. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will be giving you a brief update on the rabies work group activities, but first, I would like to acknowledge and thank the working group members for their lively discussions and hard work. Next slide, please. Um, our, uh, Lynn, Lynn Bata is our uh, other ACIP member. Thank you, Lynn, and I would also uh, like to acknowledge uh, the very hard work and great leadership of Aga Morrell and Jesse Blanton, who are our CDC Rabies Work Group leads. Other group members include the liaison representatives who are provided here for you and invited consultants, all of whom have been very active in our discussions. Next, please. 
The rabies work group was introduced in October 2018. Since then, we have spent most of our time discussing PrEP. The highlights are included here for you. Uh, there was a review of uh, vaccine safety and work group considerations for changes to PrEP. We obtained uh, feedback from the committee, the ACIP committee, about data they would need to make changes to the 2018 ACIP recommendations. We are conveying work group conclusions about pediatric patients having similar uh, responses, if not more robust than those of healthy persons. We have shown evidence to support the work group's move to use data from intradermal series to influence the intramuscular uh, series recommendations. We also explained why the 0.5 international unit per ml should be the minimum rabies antibody titer cutoff and redefine risk categories for PrEP, as well as presented grade and ETR for the two PrEP policy questions that will be discussed later. Next, please. Our activities since the last ACIP meeting included reviewing information on pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP costs, including those incurred by PrEP recipients. We also uh, started to review post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP to develop guidance for frontline clinicians who make decisions about whether PEP is indicated. We evaluated two rabies immune globulin products licensed since the 2008 ACIP recommendations were posted or provided. We are assessing data from the current ACIP recommendation for rig infiltration around the wound and for the remainder to be administered intramuscularly, and are also evaluating immunogenicity of pets and persons aged 65 years of age and older. Next, please. Our working group's goal for today, as far as PrEP is concerned is to address questions raised by the ACIP about PrEP costs, summarize clinical guidance presented at previous meetings, recap policy questions, evidence tables, and evidence to recommend frameworks, and to commence the vote on two proposed policy questions. We will also introduce PEP today by providing background information and providing um, the work group's conclusions about RIG. Next, please. This is our anticipated timeline. Uh, you can see at during June, uh, we hope to be able to provide data on PEP schedules, including grade and ETR if uh, the working group decides we would like to um, suggest changes to what is currently being done. Um, we will provide clinical guidance for PEP and PEP schedule deviations and have a vote if needed, if we identify any PEP topics that require a vote. Next slide. So for today's agenda, all the presentations are going to be provided by Dr. Agam Rao, um, of which there are several. Uh, we will be looking at rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis, the summary of background information important for today's vote, rabies pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis, but including a summary of grade and ETR, and also uh, for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis, we'll take a look at the background information, and also the working group interpretations of data about rabies immune globulin. Um, our next steps then uh, will to have, be able to have the vote uh, later on today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we uh, have Dr. Um, Rao uh, give her presentations, let me um, uh, call on uh, uh, Dr. Long. Uh, please um, state your affiliation and if you have any conflict of interest. I understand that she's on the line. Yes, this is Sarah Long. Good morning. I am professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I have no conflict to disclose. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, so, uh, Dr. Rao, would you please go ahead and uh, uh, discuss uh, rabies pre-exposure prophylaxis summary of background information? Um, there are multiple there are multiple barriers to prevent rabies in the United States. There is avoidance of risky behaviors like avoid visiting international tourist destinations known to have rabid animals, vaccination of pets and wildlife proper use of personal protective equipment when handling bats for occupational responsibilities. And if those, fail, those barriers fail, 
There is, of course, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. The rabies community describes exposures as recognized and unrecognized. This slide illustrates the difference between these. Shown on the top right are bite wounds from a terrestrial mammal, for example, a dog, raccoon, or fox. The canine tooth size is 15 to 50 millimeters in these animals, and the bite strength can cause about 320 pounds of pressure. These types of exposures are considered recognized because the person experiencing it would know that they had an encounter and present to a clinician for treatment. So the exposure would come to attention and be managed appropriately. On the bottom right is an exposure from a non-terrestrial mammal, a bat. In this case, tiny puncture wounds are evident, but in some cases, those puncture wounds can be less obvious. Tooth, uh, the tooth size in bats is 2 to 10 millimeters, and bite strength can be about 2 pounds. Uh, these could go unrecognized if uh, someone who enters, who commonly enters an area where there's a high bat concentration, uh, as part of their job, they're typically swarmed by bats, and they may not recognize when they had uh, an exposure. When these exposures occur, timely PEP alone is effective in preventing rabies. The challenges of relying on PEP, though, are that in some countries, um, there may be um, inconsistent access to PEP, the potential for unrecognized or high concentration exposures in persons like laboratory, laboratorians culturing rabies virus um, might not, uh, there might be unrecognized exposures, and the fact that some people, by nature of their jobs, may have frequent exposures that necessitate PEP and could result in a uh, multiple series of PrEP being needed. These are the situations when PrEP is important. In a PrEP naive person, PEP is rabies, immune globulin, or RIG, plus four doses of rabies vaccine. For PrEP vaccinated persons, the rabies PEP schedule after an exposure is only two doses of rabies vaccine and no PEP, uh, sorry, and no RIG. The role of PrEP is to provide some coverage if PEP is delayed because of access issues, for example, or is inadvertently not given because of an unrecognized exposure. It eliminates the need for RIG, which is very expensive and not always easily accessible internationally, and it also shortens the PEP series. Uh, the line on the bottom of the screen shows three time points in age for a hypothetical person. If a person receives PrEP after an exposure, the person would only need two doses of vaccine. Yeah, the person would only need two doses of vaccine. Now, this is, um, on the other hand, the average person in the U.S. who has no rabies exposures and PrEP is never indicated. Um, the, the risk for rabies in the U.S. is actually 15 per 100,000, so it's a relatively rare event for a high-cost treatment in a country that has a robust system for detecting and treating exposures. And so for the general population, ACIP has historically not recommended PrEP for this reason. This is the table I've shown during previous meetings, and as a reminder, I'm just going to walk through it once again. This table illustrates the work group's proposed guidance for PrEP. The column into the far left is the risk category, and we've defined these risk categories from the highest risk for rabies, which is the number one risk group at the very top, to the lowest risk for rabies, which is the number four risk group at the very bottom. The lowest risk group is the general U.S. population. As I've just discussed, PrEP is not indicated for this group. The remainder of our discussion about PrEP will focus on risk groups one through three. The nature of risk heading explains how the risks differ for each of these groups. So starting with group three, the nature of risk for this group is for recognized exposures. And the different types of occupations that are involved are animal care professionals. They're people who repeatedly handle terrestrial reservoir species like wildlife biologists and rehabilitators and trappers, spelunkers, vet students, and uh, short-term volunteers who perform hands-on animal care works, but only for short periods of time, and then also travelers. The number two risk group is an elevated risk for recognized exposures, but also unrecognized exposures. So that's how it differs from the, the number three risk group. 
These are people who handle bats for a living. They enter high-density bat environments and are commonly swarmed by bats and might not immediately recognize an exposure, and that's why we say that they could have some unrecognized exposures. They should be wearing personal protective equipment, but an exposure can still happen, and um, that is why they are included in this group here. And then the number one risk category are the people who have the highest risk for rabies. These are people who, similar to risk group number two, have both recognized and unrecognized exposures. But unlike risk group number two, these exposures can occur more commonly because they are laboratorians. And also the exposure can be an unusual one, like an aerosolized exposure or um, exposure to a high concentration of rabies virus because they're culturing. And PEP may not be administered quickly enough in those situations because of the very high dose. And that is the reason that PrEP is recommended for these persons. So the last two columns uh, here are the, the focus of today's vote. They are PrEP recommendations to ensure primary immunogenicity and long-term immunogenicity for each of the three risk groups. Um, uh, and by long-term immunogenicity, we mean um, uh, protection for ex from exposures greater than three years after the primary series. So these topics are what the rest of the presentation will focus on, um, uh, this presentation and also the next presentation. This is a simplified version of the previous table with only the risk groups, populations, and the two PrEP recommendations column. So for primary immunogenicity, for all three risk groups, the uh, current ACIP recommendations are listed on this slide, and they are for the three-dose series in the big white box here. And then to ensure long-term immunogenicity, serial titers are recommended. Um, for many of these people, including the animal care professionals and others who frequently handle terrestrial rabies in regions around the country where there is terrestrial rabies, but it's not recommended, sorry, it's not recommended for students, spelunkers, travelers, and short-term animal care workers. We explained during the October meeting why titers are recommended for persons at risk for unrecognized exposures. Uh, titers ensures that, um, uh, titer checks ensures that titers remain over 0.5 IUs per ml, which is a very high value, um, way higher than what we would expect would, would be needed to mount an anamnestic response. But if people are going to have unrecognized exposures, then we want to ensure that their titers remain as high as possible. Um, and uh, even if post-exposure prophylaxis is not sought, so it provides some assurance that um, that the person would survive even if the uh, exposure isn't a recognized one. And titers, uh, titer checks, if they're under 0.5, would then prompt a booster. And that's the current practice uh, that's that's been around um, for, for years and years for ACIP. Now, uh, persons in the number one risk group who are currently recommended by ACIP to have those titers checked every, um, uh, are supposed to get those titers checked every, every six months. So for this hypothetical laboratory and on this slide, if the titer is 0.5 IUs per ml, then no booster is given at that six month titer check. Um, but at the next titer check, if her titer is 0.5 IUs, is less than 0.5 IUs per ml, a booster is given. And this is the practice that I just described. Uh, what, what we proposed at the October ACIP meeting was that the primary series for all three risk groups be replaced with a two-dose series, so a single two-dose series for, for all three risk groups. Uh, the diagnostic laboratorians, that is, um, laboratorians who, for example, perform necropsies on animals, we, uh, as, a, as a group, thought that we should uh, change that to every six months, uh, clinical guidance every six months from the two years that is currently recommended, given the type of work that they do, um, necropsies and all, we thought laboratorians should belong to the same uh, risk category. Another thing we proposed was for the large category of veterinarians and other animal care professionals working in regions with terrestrial rabies to have an option of either one titer check at one to three years after the primary series or a booster. And I'll explain the implications of these changes on the next few slides. So um, primary immunogenicity, as I mentioned, we proposed a 0-7 two-day two -day series. The implications of that 
uh, is that there are fewer vaccine doses, but e equivalent e efficacy. And so there's really no, no downfall, I guess, uh, to, to that recommendation since the data that we presented indicated equivalent efficacy. As far as long-term immunogenicity, um, the, the research laboratorians are already recommended by ACIP to have tighter checks every six months, as I mentioned on a previous slide. And so there's no change to that that we are proposing. Diagnostic laboratorians, as I said, uh, as a group, we thought guidance should be to increase the frequency to every six months because they are laboratorians. And so that is a change, but it seemed to make sense to us to consider all laboratorians equally. Uh, bat biologists, there would be no change uh, on that front. And then for the, for the large group uh, uh, risk category number three, uh, we are proposing either uh, a, tighter, uh, a tighter check one to three years after the primary uh, series or as an alternative, a booster no sooner than day 21 and no later than three years. And our thought process for this, uh, for each of these three subgroups within the number three risk group was that for animal care professionals in terrestrial rabies regions, that would amount to fewer vaccine doses and or fewer tighter checks. So they'd get the two dose primary series and then they either get a one tighter check when they're accustomed to getting um, one every two years, or at least they're recommended to get one every two years, um, or they would, and then a boost accordingly, or they would get a booster straight away as soon as day 21, which which would, I guess, effectively be the same as the current three-dose series, but no tighter checks. And so we thought that that was uh, really no, no meaningful concerns that people would have, that the stakeholders would have. Now, animal care professionals in non-terrestrial rabies regions, like students, uh, and, and sorry, ants, students, spelunkers, and persistent travelers, people who travel beyond three years to areas uh, where there is um, rabies, it would really amount to the same number of vaccine doses or instead of the third vaccine, a titer. And uh, for people who are short-term uh, short -term employees, short-term animal care professionals, persons without sustained risk for rabies, people who travel once to uh, a rabies endemic region like India and never plan on traveling there again, beyond three years, or if they travel multiple times within three years, but not again beyond that, uh, they would, they currently have no recommendation for any boosters or titles, and there would be no change to that. They would be done after the two dose, pri uh, they would be done with prep after the two dose prep series. So we thought that all three of these would be uh, well regarded. So this brings us to our first, uh, our first policy question. And that first policy question is, uh, that the worker proposed is should a two-dose pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP series involving HDCV or PCECV IM 07 days replace the three-dose series IM 07 21 28 days for all those for whom rabies vaccine PrEP is recommended? And then our second question uh, was um, should an IM booster dose of rabies vaccine, PCECV or HDCV, be recommended as an alternative to a titer check? So as an alternative to a titer check, no sooner than day 21 and no later than three years after the two-dose pre-exposure prep series, IM 07 days, for those in the number three risk category who receive PrEP. Um, so the reason we only propose the, the booster here in the policy question is that titer checks are considered clinical guidance and do not require um, a recommendation or a vote. Now, the way to actually illustrate the, this a little bit better is that here we have uh, someone who gets a two-dose prep series and then travels, does whatever they need to do uh, you know, until three, one to three years. If they, never, if they never end up getting that titer checked or the booster, um, and sorry, if they do get a titer checked and the titer is greater than 0 0.5 IUs per ml, um, if they get the titer checked per the, the proposed uh, recommendation, then they would need no booster and then they would be good to go. They would be considered to have had pre-exposure prophylaxis for any future exposures. And if they did have an exposure years from now, um, they would be considered pre-vaccinated. They would just get the two-dose PEP series. And so they would um, benefit from having received PrEP years ago. Um, on the other hand, if we have someone who got a 0.7 days uh, prep series and had a titer checked, a uh, titer was less than 0.5 and a booster given, uh, again, they are considered to have had pre-exposure prophylaxis for any future exposures and would be similarly good to go and receive only a two-dose PEP series. 
So you can see um, we, we considered every way that this would um, impact the, the uh, implementation. Um, the actions taken in response to a tighter check for the number three risk group, this is another example. If uh, someone gets a two-dose prep series and um, at day 21, at some point between day 21 and year three, if they got the booster, they're considered to have had pre-exposure prophylaxis for any future exposures. And um, for any future rabies exposure, they would get only the two-dose prep series. PEP series. Um, so this is just, again, showing you the, the different things that the work group had um, proposed to change. The things in yellow are clinical guidance, and only the things in blue are things that will be voted on during this meeting. Only the things in blue um, uh, require, require a vote. Uh, the next presentation, I'm going to summarize the evidence to recommendations framework and show the wording of the two recommendations that you'll be voting on today and um, hope to answer any, que any questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take questions. Oh, so this is um, open for questions at this time. Dr. Goldman. Thank you, sir. Um, just a quick question. Is there any thought to um, as needed titer checks um, in the third group if someone I see is a persistent traveler, but then they stop traveling, but want to start traveling again, would there be any role to just do a titer on demand as opposed to an interval? Yeah, so we, we actually talked uh, a lot about that within the work group, and I think there's a slide in my second presentation that will answer your question. If I don't answer it, do you think you could ask that same question again? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Well, thank you. Uh, I, I'm quite certain that um, you've been through this many times in uh, all of the information that you've presented to the ACIP at our various meetings. But um, could you just remind me, I'm assuming from the presentation that there's no recommendation for a titer to be checked after the initial primary series of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I'm assuming that's because of, you know, data that there is essentially 100% response uh, among vaccinees to PrEP. Um, could you just very briefly remind me about that, please? Yeah, sure. It's exactly as you said. So there's there's such robust data that after after a two dose primary series, uh, unless you're immunocompromised, you would mount an appropriate titer. You would have a titer over over the the minimum antibody titer, and so there's no really value to to getting one. There are, uh, and so we don't explicitly say anything in the ACIP recommendations. But for laboratorians, for example, um, individual institutions, individual uh, laboratory directors. Um, can make recommendations as they deem fit, and we do know that many do require that a uh, that a that a uh, titer be checked after completion of the primary series to confirm that. But that's really up to their 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 the, up to them whether or not they want to do that. Dr. Sanchez, um, I just had a question, um, and maybe just some clarification in your risk category three. Um, on the slide that you have the implications of proposed changes with the um, you know, risk group, I'm not sure which number it is, but it has the risk group one, two, three, and you put the long-term immunogenicity and then the yellow and, or orange and, um, and blue. That in risk group three, short-term animal care professionals and persons without sustained risk for rabies. The implications, yeah, there. The implications, there were no additional vaccine and no titers. So your box, yellow and blue, go through all three, including the short term. So are you recommending, should that, yeah. is that correct? I'm sorry, you're, you're totally correct. I, that is my error. That, that yellow and blue box should only cover the first two. It should not cover the short term people. So um, yeah, I apologize, that's, that's, that's an error. 
that okay so that recommendation is staying the same like you that's correct yeah it's it's only for the the two groups the animal care professionals in terrestrial rabies regions and animal care professionals in non-terrestrial rabies regions students spelunkers and travelers all who have uh, persistent exposure beyond three years and those are the only people so these short-term folks and others who don't have persistent exposure beyond three years um, nothing further needed thank you and I, I guess I actually use this slide in a lot of my presentations for my next presentation. And so I guess the same error, I'm, I apologize, the same error is, is on all of those slides. Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thank you. So could, could you discuss a little bit more of the long interval for that booster dose between day 21 and year three? I just think with that long an interval, it may lead to a little bit of uncertainty at at clinical care sites about kind of what's the what's the what what's the intention and what's the ideal uh, interval yeah, so we, we uh, the work group reviewed a whole lot of data, and I, I presented it during the October meeting very, very briefly, but essentially if uh, people who get a booster um, between, you know, at one year or so, their titers end up staying higher for longer. And so um, those people would be expected to have an anamnestic response to an exposure for, for longer because their titers remain higher for longer. Um, we have data that, that was part of the, the grade table that was presented in October for um, for boostability up until three years, and that's why that's how we came up with that la that um, far end of the of the interval, and the early end of the interval, the day twenty one is based on the current ACIP recommendation. So, initially, as a work group, when we were discussing this, we were talking about a booster or a titer check um, between one and three years, and just for implementation purposes, we recognize that for travelers in particular, for example, asking them to return uh, a year from now to get a tighter or a booster done isn't really feasible. And so the day 21 option uh, is, I mean, we call, we're calling it a booster, but essentially it's that, it's the equivalent of this, um, the current ACIP recommendations for a third dose at um, day 21 or day 28. Um, we're calling it a booster because it's not essential to, um, to, to receive before you can go out for travel or anything else. But um, if you wanted to, you could, as a travel clinician, schedule that that booster dose as soon as day 21. Or you could uh, make it a flexible schedule and have them return after their, their trip to, to India or Africa and have it, um, have it done you know, 60 days later or whatever it is that once they return. But you would have it scheduled that way versus relying on them to come back in a year. Are there any other questions from the group? I'm not seeing any. OK. Uh, Dr. Rao, would you go forward? Yep, thank you. So this is a presentation about uh, more about the, um, the, the same topic, just to ensure that everyone has all the information that they need to make a decision about the vote later today. So the first few slides I'm presenting are background information before I recap the evidence recommendations framework that was presented in October. Um, during a 2019 ACIP workgroup meeting, we mentioned that, or sorry, during an ACIP meeting, we mentioned that the workgroup reviewed in a lot of detail the response that various populations have to rabies vaccines. And we found at that time, we, we actually did a systematic review of the literature to look to see what the, um, what the antibody responses, what the titer levels were after primary vaccination in various populations. We found quite a lot of information about children, uh, a little less in pregnant women, um, and some, some data about persons over the age of 65 years, but essentially everybody mounted responses similar to those of healthy adults, um, regardless of the series, unless they were immunocompromised. So we concluded that similar to what the ACIP has concluded in the past, that for persons with altered immunity, Efficacy can be a concern, and if PrEP has to be administered while the person has altered immunity, a titer should be checked after completion of a primary series to ensure appropriate titer levels. And this is actually very commonplace. There's three specific labs in the U.S. that check these titers in, in persons, and uh, clinicians provide boosters until titers are over 0.5 based on those titer values. And sometimes patients require several boosters because of those immune-compromising conditions. Um, the work group concluded then that the two proposed recommendations that you'll vote on today would therefore apply to all persons who get PrEP 
and those persons with altered immunity would be managed in the same way that they've always been managed, um, and for which we have clinical guidance in the uh, in the ACIP recommendations that a titer check be done and boosters given until appropriate peak antibody levels are confirmed. There we go. Um, as a reminder, these are the two rabies vaccines that are licensed in the U.S. They've been used in the U.S. for decades. And on our review, there's been no change in the favorable safety profile of these two vaccines. During a previous meeting, the ACIP asked us to characterize the population for whom the PrEP recommendations in the U.S. apply. Um, after uh, some effort, we were uh, able to find some data here. We created a math mathematical model based on work workforce statistics produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and market research provided by one of the product sponsors, Bavarian Nordic. And we estimated that 170,000 doses of PrEP are given each year in the United States, and this includes 500 doses that we estimated are given as booster doses after titer checks. The numbers of people who receive PrEP we estimate is, uh, is about 60,535 per year, and the numbers by risk groups are listed on this slide with travelers and other risk groups making up the largest sector at 41,000. Uh, the numbers for the other groups are as listed here. And then regarding adherence to the PrEP recommendations, um, we have data that vet students, we know that vet students and laboratory personnel are known to be compliant with the ACIP recommendations because it's enforced by their vet schools and by laboratory directors, respectively. But for the remaining careers listed on this slide, we found answers from an unpublished uh, CDC report. The, the data was part of a survey that was completed a few years ago by uh, Dr. Jesse Blanton, who is co-leading this work group with me. And uh, most of the findings were published in a manuscript, but um, uh, the data shown on this slide was, was part of the survey and was not published. I want to draw your attention to the veterinary technicians and staff bullet here in yellow because in other published studies, um, not just in Dr. Blanton's study, but in other studies, the adherence was much lower at 30 to 40 percent. Uh, we hypothesize that all of the numbers on this slide are an overestimate of the compliance because of who was surveyed. The survey was sent to about 2,000 members of professional organizations who are certified providers. So there are a lot of uncertified animal care techs, for example, practicing, and this survey would not have reached those people. This particular population um, that the survey was sent out to belonged to their professional uh, organization and may have been more compliant with ACIP recommendations given that, given all of that activity that they, they had. Um, this slide's intended to show that a lot of people for whom ACIP re recommends PrEP are, are seemingly not receiving it. And, and that's an, uh, an important point that we wanted to make since it was part of our evidence to recommendations framework in October. So uh, this brings me to the summary of the ETR, and I'll start with policy question number, or sorry, I'll, yes, I'll start with pro policy question number one, which is about primary immunogenicity. So um, this is the first uh, PICO question. That, that's what's listed on this side. The intervention is the proposed two-dose series, the zero seven days rabies prep schedule. The comparator is the, the current series, the 0 7 21, 28 days rabies vaccine prep schedule. And the only outcome is um, primary immunogenicity because, as mentioned previously, the uh, safety profile for these vaccines has remained favorable. So rabies, we know, we know the reason why this is an important issue, rabies is nearly always fatal. PrEP is imp an important component of preventing human rabies in the U.S. PrEP is critically important to some persons. I think we've gone over those people, uh, the, the ones in risk categories one, two, and three, all of which are listed here on this slide. And rabies, uh, modern cell culture vaccines are very effective. So ACIPs were recommended PrEP for decades. Uh, the non-compliance among some for whom it is recommended is of concern, and we hypothesize that uh, out-of-pocket costs are related to that. Some occupations don't enforce it, don't require it, uh, those, even though it's recommended by the ACIP. And we also know anecdotally from speaking with uh, travel clinicians, including those who are travel medicine clinicians, including those who are on our work group, that there, uh, people tend to, tend to book these travel clinic appointments without much time for the third dose of the rabies vaccine to be given. So um, if their wheels up before, uh, in the interval between um, the clinic appointment and their departure is less than 21 days, then pre-exposure is, is often not given. 
So to summarize the workgroup's interpretations of the various ETR dom domains, we concluded the benefits of this change series are minimal because people have 100% zero conversion for both the propo proposed two-dose series and the current three-dose series. We thought harms were minimal because there were no safety concerns, and the benefit-to-harm ratio therefore favored both the two-dose and the three-dose series. And we went over the overall certainty of the evidence in the grade table in detail at the last meeting, but you can see here that the, the level it was a level two or moderate certainty of evidence um, in the data that we presented. Uh, going back to PrEP costs, the reimbursement price for a rabies vaccine dose is, um, is approximately $331. Uh, additional costs are, are variable depending on the location where PrEP is given, and the figure to the right is from the same unpublished study that Dr. Blinton um, uh, pursued, as mentioned earlier. And you can see that professionals go to a variety of facilities to get their PrEP vaccines. They go to doctor's offices, travel medicine clinics, occupational health clinics. Um, they get it at vet school, public health clinic. And not shown in this figure is actually that there are a certain number of people who do go to the emergency department for pre-exposure profiles. Axis. Two percent of respondents reported going to the ED for these doses, and the work group members, some of our work group members, actually have confirmed this to be true from their experience as well. So we extrapolated from that, since three doses of vaccine are needed for PrEP, that costs are at a minimum around $1,100, and at a maximum, uh, taking into consideration emergency department costs, can be $3,500 on average. We've read anecdotally on vet school blogs that some of these costs are sometimes subsidized, uh, but there still seems to be a cost to all these recipients. And the $3,500 number included on this slide is actually from unpublished data from a robust analysis by the Minnesota Department of Health several years ago that outlined um, ED costs related to PEP, and we were able to uh, derive these numbers from that. Now, for laboratorians, we um, anticipate all costs are paid for by the employers. But as the same, as part of the same uh, survey that Dr. Blanton performed, respondents were asked, "Does your insurance cover all or part of PrEP and tighter doses? And does your employer uh, cover all or part of, of PrEP and tighter doses?" And you can see the answers listed here for each of those. The the amount paid by these professionals. Um, I mean, there was an out-of-pocket cost. As you can see, the, there wasn't full full payment uh, reported among these professionals who responded to this survey. And the survey did um, include about 2,000 2, uh, people here in the United States. So all of this contributed to our, um, to our thoughts about um, the domains for the evidence to recommendations framework, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, is, does the part of the population, um, is there any uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the outcomes? No, the target population values protection from rabies, and there's likely no important variability. Acceptability to stakeholders, yes, a shorter schedule is uh, preferred by patients and providers, and yes, um, the shorter less cost is probably also appreciated by them given that the efficacy is um, is very good. Reasonable and efficient allocation of resources, uh, our work group felt, yes, the cost savings, and because rabies vaccine shortages have occurred in the U.S., uh, stakeholders will appreciate it. The rabies vaccine shortages is a, is a real thing. It does happen periodically, and if there are fewer doses of rabies prep, um, then there's less risk for those impacting uh, our communities. Uh, the impact on equity was thought to be probably reduced because of the decreased costs, and the feasibility was thought to be um, thought to be there because of the shorter series. And as I, yeah, because of a shorter series, so there's fewer clinic appointments. Uh, target population sentiments uh, from the previous slides I showed, the data shows that PrEP recipients incur high out-of-pocket costs. And for the ETR question, assessing whether the target population feels the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects, the work group concluded probably yes. We know from members of our work group who are travel medicine clinicians, the persons who should receive PrEP for travel are often not receiving it because they make their clinic appointment with less than 21 days before their planned travel. And the current three-dose series stretches out to those day 21. And for that reason, clinicians have said that they've not always given it to patients who they, they would otherwise have given it to. So all of this together made the work group conclude that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. And um, we then drafted this uh, recommendation. 
ACIP recommends a two-dose, zero seven days intramuscular rabies vaccine series in persons for whom rabies vaccine pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP is indicated. Um, and um, would be interested in your feedback on the phrasing of this. Um, I'll move on to the ETR for policy question number two. So this one is about long-term immunogenicity, um, and as you recall, that is over risk for rabies um, beyond three years from the primary vaccination series. And the PICO question is listed on this slide. The intervention is um, is is a day 21 to year three rabies vaccine booster after the zero seven days rabies vaccine prep schedule. Comparison is no rabies vaccine booster after the zero seven days rabies vaccine prep schedule that we're proposing. And the outcome is um, long-term immunogenicity. And again, it's the only outcome. So a reminder, this policy question is only for people in that number three risk category. It's only for the veterinarians, animal care workers, travelers, et cetera. It's not for laboratorians or bat biologists since uh, it's already on the books for those individuals to have titer checks at certain intervals and any any drop in their titers is would be reacted to. Um, so this is only for the, the number three risk group. Uh, immunology suggests that an anamnestic response occurs to an exposure that demonstrated primary immunogenicity regardless of the series. And WHO actually um, did not comment on um, a need for a booster or a titer or anything after the two-dose primary series when they made a change to their recommendations a few years ago. But because rabies is nearly 100% fatal, the work group really wanted to take the most cautious and conservative route. And um, there's data to show an anamnestic response occurs up until the three-year time point, but there's no data in our grade table about whether or not an anamnestic response occurs after that. We imagine that it does, but there is no data to confirm that. Uh, we do know that when uh, boosters are given one to three years after the primary series, as I, as I mentioned previously, the titers remain higher for longer, and um, that the current PrEP series is a three-dose series with a third dose as soon as day 21. And so all of that um, uh, coincided for us to, to provide the, the recommendation for a booster on the, just to be as, as cautious as possible. There is new data, though, since we've made this proposal in late January. There was new data published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. It was e-published in late January. The paper's titled Long-Term Memory Response After a Single Intramuscular Rabies Booster Vaccination. And as part of that report, there were six people who were included in that study who received our two-dose PrEP series, our proposed uh, 07 PrEP series. And they were evaluated 10 to 11 years after that series. And five out of six of them actually had titers that were over 0.5. 0.5 IUs per ml or at 0.5 IUs per ml at that um, titer check 10 or 11 years later. And all of them, they were given boosters, and all of them had an appropriate um, fourfold titer increase after the boost booster, showing that the series is boostable. And also perhaps that a lot of people may not even need a booster if that titer check is done per our guidance um, at one to three years after the primary series. So um, this is um, encouraging information because WHO's two-dose recommendations were made in 2018. We expect more data will come out over the, the coming years about long-term immunogenicity. And perhaps at that point, we'd be able to, um, to not recommend uh, or not, not require any titers or boosters for, for these people in the number three risk group. But as I mentioned, we wanted to take the most conservative route and felt that um, this issue was important enough to have um, a resolution and not rely on um, there being upcoming data. Um, but until there is uh, more data, we at CDC are, um, have been talking about ways that we might be able to assess this as well in the years going forward if the two-dose series is is approved by the ACIP committee. And until then, the worker felt that the benefits of offering a one-time booster as an option for the peace of mind of ensuring long-term immunogenicity was moderate. A booster at day 21 is, is, as we've already discussed, is equivalent to getting a current three-dose series for, for implementation purposes. It's known to provide long-term immunogenicity. And 100% of subjects who did get um, um, a booster between one and three years, we already know from um, the grade table that we presented during the October meeting had um, 
had a boostability. So the harms we thought were minimal. There's no expected safety concerns. We felt that the, um, the intervention was favored in this situation. And the overall certainty of the evidence from the, the grade table presented in October was uh, low certainty of evidence or level three because it was, um, uh, it was considered observational data. That was part of the reason. The target population sentiment, does the target population feel the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects? The work group's interpretation was probably yes. Stakeholders want to avoid acquiring a high stakes infection. They want to uh, avoid their, their staff and all from acquiring a high stakes infection. A booster provides reassurance that outweighs any inconvenience, and so we thought um, probably yes. Uh, target population sentiments, uncertainty about or variability and how much people value the outcomes. We thought that there's no uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the outcomes because the target population values protection from rabies and there's likely no important variability. Um, this we thought was acceptable to stakeholders because they are accustomed to accommodating a third dose of rabies vaccine and will find it acceptable to have a booster as an option. And then we thought, yes, uh, it is a reasonable and uh, efficient allocation of resources and that the recipients as well might be encouraged to, to follow, uh, to adhere to the ACIP recommendations given the, the personal cost savings that they would experience. Now, if you're curious about the costs of titers compared to boosters, um, uh, as you'll remember, this particular policy question is about a booster as an alternative to a titer, and the titer part is clinical guidance and does not require a vote. But the reason we propose this is that titers can cost significantly less than what a booster would cost. A titer, if you look at the, the websites for the, the places that do provide these um, um, assessments of the titer values, those can be as low as $50 and up to about $75 or so, and when you figure in the cost of the blood draw and the clinic appointment to get the blood drawn, it ends up being a lot less than what the cost would be from a booster. So if we take that $331 that I, I showed on a previous slide for the cost of a booster and, um, and consider the additional cost for for uh, a travel clinic appointment or whatever clinic appointment. And if you go to the ED, of course, as we showed earlier, um, that's that's going to add up significantly. And and so someone, some people might, might favor um, going to a tighter first and I suppose taking their chances um, that the tighter will yield a, a value over 0 0.5 IUs per ml. Um, if, of course, that is not the case, they would still need to schedule a booster, uh, booster appointment. Regarding impact on equity, the work group concluded that the impact on equity option of a booster after a two-dose series was uncertain. Some prep costs are out of pocket, but because tighter is an option, inequity could be resolved by choosing that option. And then regarding feasibility to implement receipt of the booster dose, the work group talked at length about this, and it seemed to be the biggest concern for travelers because travelers aren't likely to come back one to three years after the primary vaccination series to get a tighter check or booster. Those providers may, for ease of implementation, opt to schedule a booster dose as soon as the patient returns from their travel. Um, the work group felt that that flexibility in the time interval for a booster was, was going to be feasible for all. And uh, the conclusions then, based on all of this, was that the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. Now here's the uh, recommendation language. Uh, the ACIP recommends an intramuscular booster dose of rabies vaccine as an alternative to a titer check no sooner than day 21, but no later than three years after the two-dose prep series for those who have sustained an elevated risk for only recognized rabies exposures, i.e. those in risk category number three of rabies prep recommendations table. The work group considered any potential fallouts that could come or any complications that could come from this proposed recommendation, and I am going to show you those um, two on this slide and the next slide. One such scenario is the one depicted here of a person who receives the two-dose prep schedule and then does not receive a tighter booster by the three-year time point and then has an exposure. Um, and so until more data comes from Europe or the U.S. about the long-term immunogenicity of a two-dose series, the cautious route would be to administer PEP as if the patient is now PrEP naive. And so that person would get a uh, rig plus the four-dose vaccine series at a schedule of 0, 3, 7, and 14. Uh, I think this is the question that was asked during the, the previous Q&A session. Uh, we, we thought that that was the, the safest route. Anything that requires, uh, that, that rec is a recommendation for boosters 
numbers would um, would be complicated given the given the fact that we don't have data beyond three years. Another scenario we identified is shown on this slide. If a person got um, got uh, no titer or booster by the year three time interval and then was traveling again. So they didn't have an exposure, but they then decided later later in life that they wanted to travel to um, a region where they would need prep again. Um, those situations are currently come up all the time for us in the, the rabies group at CDC and for health departments as well. And those situations are typically handed on a case by case basis. The reason they come up so frequently is that it's it's a common it's a relatively common occurrence. I, I wouldn't say it's very common, but it's a relatively uh, it's reasonably common occurrence for us to hear about someone who only got two doses of a prep series or only got um, uh, two doses of uh, a post-exposure prophylaxis before it was um, it was deemed unnecessary and it was not completed for an exposure that was deemed to not be um, one that required PEP. And so uh, in those situations, we really have dealt with them on a case-by-case -case basis and have not outlined specific guidance in the ACIP recommendations because it really depends on a number of factors. Um, and so we, we thought we would take that route again in this case and are hoping that the number of people that fall into this group would similarly be small, um, similar to what we experience now, would be uh, our, uh, you know not an overwhelming number of people that, that have uh, are in this situation because of that uh, flexible, the flexible recommendations of, of getting a, a booster dose as soon as day 21, which is the current PrEP series. And that is um, that is all for the pre-exposure um, for the pre-exposure issues that I wanted to present to you all today in preparation for the vote. And so I'll take any questions about this, including anything about the wording of the the policy questions, if there are any concerns. And um, after the Q and A, can move on to to post-exposure. Thank you for that marathon session. Um, we'll go ahead and entertain questions. Uh, Dr. Paling, I see your hand up first. All right, thank you for this presentation. And um, I'm very glad that you've got this clinical um, guidance scenario here. And, um, you know, the traveling again, the splunker that's going to go splunking again, there's several people that fall into this category. And um, I do wonder if, it's, if there should be some guidance, because this is going to occur. And uh, I'm just wondering about the feasibility of a case-by-case -case rather than having um, specific, specific guidance for this situation. Yeah, thank you. So we're so if if there's a spelunker who is going to be a spelunker for more than three years, then they should be getting. Well, they they for, actually let me retract that. So spelunkers often um, are not do not get pre-exposure prophylaxis partly because they typically know when they have an exposure. They um, you know they they are not like bat biologists who are getting swarmed by a whole lot of bats on a regular basis and who might not realize which uh, which of those times they had a unrecognized exposure despite uh, personal protective equipment. So. The, the recreational spelunker typically would, would know that they got brushed up against by a bat and would, would come to get post-exposure prophylaxis. But all of the other people, um, if, there is, if there is a concern that they're going to have a risk for exposures beyond three years, then the, the, the second policy recommendation, the one uh, calling for a booster as an alternative to the titer, um, at at um, you know as soon as day twenty one as late as three years is is what they should do is what those patients should get. Um, are are you suggesting I guess as a point of clarification? Are you saying that someone thinks that their exposure is limited to three years and that they change their mind that that, that ends up changing down the road? Yeah. So the scenario that's on the slide. So I didn't get my um, boost because I wasn't traveling to areas, and now it's five, seven, ten years down the line. Yeah. So one one um, thing we thought about this is that we're we're very much hoping and and and, and believe that there will be uh, more data coming out of Europe, given that the uh, WHO recommendations for the two dose prep series was was um, instituted in 2018. And um, given that newly newly published JID article, that was our impression that there's more to come. But um, we also are hope that at CDC are, are are hoping that you know if this if this does get passed to to do some um, to 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 collect some data. 
data that would help us understand boostability beyond the three-year time point. And if we had that data, if we knew that people's titers um, continued to, um, like in response to a, a booster, there was an anamnestic response, then, then this recommendation for, uh, this second recommendation, this recommendation for a booster uh, or a titer check could, could potentially be eliminated entirely. Um, it is, I, I think at the last meeting, people wondered, well, why can't we wait for that data? The problem is, is that there's no certainty of when that data will come out. And we as a group felt that um, the numbers of people who are getting PrEP is, is, is so much smaller than it should be based on the ACIP recommendations. And since there is very clear efficacy data uh, for the two-dose series and that this is all just being done for cautious purposes and really shouldn't inconvenience um, the providers and the patients very much from the current series, we thought that it made sense to initiate it now um, and not uh, hope for, for data to come forth. But hopefully <laughs> it will be such data that comes forth in this um, recommendation when the people getting vaccinated now are 10, 11, 12 years down the road, the, we'll, we'll have an answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Freihofer, please. Uh, yeah, Sandra Freihofer, uh, American Medical Association. Is there any way you could post the corrected slide on the websites for people to download since there was an error? Yes, I, it sounds like we can. Um, but not until tomorrow. So it would be after the vote. Does that affect the vote? No. Nope. I'm sorry. I don't think it'll affect the vote. Dr. Freihofer, does that answer your question? Yes, that's fine. Thank you so much. That would be really helpful just to have for reference for the future. Thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldman, please. Thank you. Excellent presentation. I think the two dose series is absolutely um, helpful, but back to my earlier question and exactly what this clinical guidance scenario comes up with, I'm only wondering in the framework of the question for guidance, um, for those who are traveling again to, and I hate using the term shared clinical decision making, but if a patient wants to come in and get their titers tested before they resume travel to see if they have um, appropriate protection, uh, would that be guidance that would be helpful to clinicians? Certainly before the pandemic, um, when patients were traveling a lot, uh, they come in and want to know their vaccine status and if they needed various uh, travel vaccines. So it might be helpful to have that kind of clinical guidance instead of just saying it's a case by case basis, but to put in the recommendation, uh, you know, if the patient wants to know their titer before resuming travel again, it's acceptable or okay to do, because uh, that also might be helpful for insurance coverage for them, and titers are easy enough to get, so just a thought. Yeah, no, actually, that's a, a really good point. You're right. We could we could clarify that um, if, if people are willing to get a titer um, and then boost her after that titer, then um, we could certainly include that as um, as recommendations. Now, if their titer is, under, is above 0 0.5, obviously, they'd be good to go. If their titer is under 0 0.5, they would need a booster and then they would need a titer to confirm that they boosted. Reason being that we don't have that data after three years that that boosting happens. And so um, our work group discussed this and I guess they, their concern was that a lot of people, you know, especially travelers, they have a hard time, they're going to have a hard time um, fitting that in before they travel. So tighter, booster, tighter, that might take some time. It, it couldn't be as soon as one week for titers to be uh, turned back around, the results to come around, but it can be as long as four weeks. And so that just needs to be taken into consideration. But um, certainly that, that can be something that we mention in the guidance. We can provide, provide that information. Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, uh, AAP Red Book. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I believe you you made mention, and I may have I may have missed some of the details on this about uh, these recommendations, obviously including children, predominantly ch children who are traveling. Um, can can you discuss a bit further about the data on a two dose series in children, please, for prep? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Kimberlin. So in the um, in the evidence table that I presented in October, uh, there were observational um, studies. And there was one of those studies um, 
Subcharian was the name of the author. And um, one of those studies, actually, I believe it's in my extra slides here. Uh, one of the, oh my. Um, that paper involved, I believe, 400 subjects, and I think 200 were um, involved. There it is, Subcharian there, 1999. Um, 200 were in the intervention uh, group and 200, or about 200 in the comparison group, and those were children with a, a mean age of, of 10 um, that ended up having appropriate tighter responses. So, so children were included in the... Um, the grade table that we presented in October. Does that answer your question, Dr. Kimberlin? Uh, yes, I believe so. Th this particular observational study, how, how far out were they followed? Um, in other words, over what time was this, was this equivalency um, recognized? So this is only for the, the first policy question for the primary immunogenicity. So their titers would have been checked uh, two to three weeks after completion of the primary series. For the, for the second recommendation about long-term immunogenicity, there was really only two papers that were included in the grade table. And um, those were... Uh, those were these, the, I know we said it says policy question number one, but it was these same two papers and there were, were not children. There were, uh, the youngest age group was, was age 18 about boostability. So do we not know the duration of titers above a threshold over time in children with two doses? Um, not from this, not from this prep series, but I, I know that Dr. Blanton and Dr. Wallace, our SMEs, are on the line. Um, can either of you weigh in on that? Hey, this is Ryan Wallace. Um, I, I think to equate the policy question one that has the data for children under the age 18 to the data we're seeing here also requires some, um, um, review of the animal data that I believe was shared back in October, but there is a strong correlation between boostability and achieving the 0 0.5 IUs per ml level. So there would have to be an assumption made that because they got the 0 0.5 after primary series, the, um, the animal data would definitely say that they would boost long-term. And then we see that repeated in the, the, the two studies shown on the slide now that were unfortunately relegated to only the adult population. But immunogenicity-wise, that 0.5 level is the recognized level of an adequate response to vaccination, which correlates to boostability long-term. Yeah, this is Jesse Glenn. Um, I would just add to that the while there are a few studies that looked at the long, well, there's few studies that looked at the long-term immunogenicity for the 07 schedule. There are certainly other um, studies that have involved children uh, looking at other reduced schedule, um, usually at 028, um, uh, to follow the childhood immunization schedules. Um, and some of those up to a year have found, you know, similar sort of boostability um, for these individuals. And as Ryan has said, really across all studies. Um, you know, regardless of the schedule, route, vaccine, et cetera, um, persons who have an adequate primary response always boost um, up to 10 years out for some of the studies that have been done. And thank you for, for a, to, to follow up. For a child, the boostability probably would be, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, but I need it. There's a question mark at the end. They would be receive two doses of vaccine, they would go on their international travel, they would be mauled by a dog, and so the and and presumably mauled to a greater extent than an adult because they can't protect themselves as well as an adult because they're a small child. The boostability would be the post-exposure prophylaxis that would then be administered, presuming that they're in a place that they have rapid access to PEP. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that, that is correct. Sorry, I'll go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Plant. So I was just going to say that's correct. Uh, the, basically, that, that mauling of the dog, that's the exposure. Um, and because they got pre-exposure prophylaxis, they would have boosted. They would, have, they would only require uh, two doses of post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, two doses of rabies vaccine as post-exposure prophylaxis. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. 
But yes, thank you. I, I just had a logistical question thinking about policy option uh, three and uh, hearing some of the questions uh, that Dr. Sanchez uh, started. Would there be value in uh, the, uh, separating the short-term group from risk category three and creating a risk category four since uh, adherence varies so considerably to begin with? Um, okay, so I, I let me, it, I understand the question correctly. It sounds like the question is, should we remove people who are short-term, short term, have short-term exposure from risk category three and have them be in their own risk category? Um, yeah, I mean, we could do that. The, the, um, the second column, you know, the when I when I talk about long term immunogenicity, it's sort of like not applicable for for the people who are uh, short term who have short term um, less than three years of rabies risk. Um, but it's yeah, so it's like sort of not applicable. But we could certainly put um, put them in a separate category and and um, tease that out so it's very clear that they are their own group. <laughs> I mean, essentially, they would be every population mentioned in uh, in risk category number three, but people who only had that risk for up to three years. This is Sharon. Um, sorry, I can't find how to put my hand up today. Uh, the the uh, one of the conversations that we had regarding the short term people is that they also do intermittent work. Um, they may be intermittent workers, volunteers, travelers who are going back to similar places. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Talbot. Yeah, so um, I guess mine's more of a statement than a question. Um, it sounds like one of the biggest issues with immunization is that those that are high risk are not getting it due to the barriers of cost. And I'm concerned that the reduction of one immunization is not significant enough of a decrease in the barrier to, to protect the lives that are at risk. And so... I feel like this is a nice attempt, but may not be the right place to put the effort in that requiring immunization and payment by providers or by um, employers would be much more appropriate than shortening the number or reducing the number of shots. Um, and the reason I say this is because this is a lethal disease. Um, and we are still waiting on data from Europe. And I, I think we could spend a lot of time and effort um, improving the payment of these and we'll await data before reducing the number of shots. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we, um, we were thinking that it's not just about, um, I mean, the reason we recommended or are proposing a two-dose PrEP series is is not just for cost savings. It's because the data indicates that there's, and it seemed to be robust data, at least the, the data that we presented, it was a level, level two. Um, it was good data to show that the efficacy is is um, is no different from that for a three-dose series. And so, I mean, if we can accomplish the same thing with fewer vaccines, that's the reason why that the first policy question is proposed. The costs come into come in with the uh, second policy question a little bit more. Um, but again, we're taking the extreme cautious route by even thinking that long-term immunogenicity is a concern. As as Dr. Blanton just mentioned, um, there's really not really any reason that we would suspect that someone who has a really good titer after completion of the primary series would not boost years and years later. Uh, because, but because rabies is 100% fatal, that's why we're proposing this, um, this suggestion. And we don't think it'll be um, any more inconvenient, and we're hoping that it's a transition to uh, you know, possibly dropping the, uh, the, the suggestion for a titer or a booster entirely once there's more data available. Uh, we do know that we did reach out to WHO. They have not heard, or at least they they not, no cases of any uh, failures related to this two-dose prep series have been reported to them. Um, and um, so we found all yes, of that I, sort of comforting. I, but I guess my, my issue here is that you can reduce the number of doses, but until it's required and paid for by the employers and providers, it really doesn't make a difference. 
Um, and so I think we really, um, that's where our effort should be at this time. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to interject. Uh, I'm sorry, because uh, it's pertinent to the question. Um, we aren't doing this for cost savings as a primary reason to, to do this. We're doing uh, this to give people confidence that two doses is plenty um, to to be protective at least out to three years. We have good data to support this decision. And the reason we're being so cautious with all these titers is to try and gather some of, of that data so we can um, further extend um, the period of time for which somebody might need another vaccine, if should they need a vaccine, or uh, see whether they're uh, protected for or, or longer periods of time and may not need so many tighter checks. Yeah, I guess I'll just add also that we actually are trying to pursue the, the other direction that you mentioned. We, um, In that, we have been looking into whether or not something could be done to um, to facilitate vaccinations happening for people that ACIP re uh, recommends it for. But as, as you know, the rabies vaccine series is not um, the childhood vaccine series. It's not a mandatory vaccine series. And that is part of the reason that it is challenging to ensure that insurance companies uh, pay for pre-exposure prophylaxis and employers as well. Um, so we did have some offline sort of conversations with or email exchanges with um, various people about this from ACIP and from, from AHIP about this. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, to Dr. Bernstein, I think actually that might be a, a good way to um, to have another risk category for the short-term animal care professionals because it really is different and, there, and the implications are also different. But then the other comment that I wanted to make was that um, I really do think that including in the ultimate guidance, even if it's not a vote or anything about the traveling again, um, where they're handled on a case-by-case -case basis, I do think that um, it should be important to recommend, to make some sort of um, of um, guidance to that. Just, just a comment, and it was brought up before, but I wanted to bring that up again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fry, your hand is still up. Is that from a previous comment, or? Uh, uh, yes, I'll take it down. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein, your hand is still up, too. Uh, just want to make sure. I'll take know. it. I'll take it down, sorry. No, no, thank you. Um, Dr. Lee. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to ask a few questions. One is, could you remind us the size of the population for um, groups one, two, and three? Um, the second question I had, well, actually, maybe I'll just um, pause there for a second, and then I have two comments. Uh, yeah, I think it'll take us a minute to pull up that slide. Do you happen to know which slide number that was? Let me see. Oh, it's slide number four. Slide number four, Chris. Yeah, so I, I, this is the, is this what you were referring to? I'm sorry, was it this or was it the table? With, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about the table um, and sort of just putting the sizes next to them to understand who falls in what category. It's... Um, Kind of uh, so I can quickly. tell you the laboratorians are the the number one risk group and it's a relatively small group. Um, uh, number two is uh, is bat biologists and others who are working directly with bats on a regular basis or entering high density bat areas and that would be a, a component of the wildlife biologists listed here at 400. And then the bulk, um, you know, the largest category is the group three, which is everybody else listed on this slide, the travelers and the other risk groups, the veterinary technicians, the veterinary students, the animal control people, the, um, those would all be the other people. So the, the laboratory personnel, sorry, is listed here as 480. Um, for, for risk group one, the, the wildlife biologist, 400, a component of that would be the bat folks, and then everybody else on this slide would be risk groups three um, or four, I guess the newly proposed risk group four. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I guess a couple points that are, I find really interesting. One is that 
Um, it's challenging, I think, in general to think about de-implementation um, uh, for vaccines. Uh, you know, we've done it before, but it's it's been challenging. I, I do think that the rationale for equivalence, at least, uh, makes sense. And uh, that is often, you know, in the uh, clinical trial equivalent, you know, just trying to understand that if there is equivalent benefit risk balance, um, and the um, rationale is to minimize the uh, uh, reduced unnecessary doses. It makes sense. I think, you know, you've heard the concern about whether or not long term we're going to have any issues with uh, breakthrough disease, uh, particularly for those who might have unrecognized exposures. Um, I guess just for that group three, which is the largest group, I guess I don't have as much concern about one and two, in part because we know that they'll be highly likely to get their um, titers or get boosted. Um, you know, I worry a little bit about the um, implementation and potentially access issues with regard to uh, adherence to the recommendations or clinical guidance uh, for the group three. And I think that is probably where the uncertainty is the greatest. Um, so, you know, I, I think for me, I just, I wanted to reflect that uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, I think, for the groups where we know that we can get good adherence I think having some reassurance and perhaps clarity in clinical guidance, as was mentioned previously, will help us ensure that good adherence for that large group three, which really includes a wide variety of individuals. Um, that would actually, uh, again, reassure me that we could do a better job as clinicians uh, caring for these patients uh, to ensure that they are optimally protected um, in that situation. So the two questions that remain for me are, one is uh, assuming that this change uh, happens, I'm assuming there are no specific requirements about number of doses other than completing rabies vaccinations if, if you needed to be able to um, uh, enter into another country, for example, um, since it would align with the WHO recommendations. And then the second question I have is more generic and relates to the equity domain. I still find that wording confusing to me. I understand the intent and agree with the intent, but I... Um, I'm having a hard time with the way that the checkbox went off, uh, and so wanted to ask for clarity and guidance around how to interpret uh, those equity uh, uh, checkboxes. Um, so the, the way that we interpreted it as a work group was, is the the second policy, I think you're referring to the second policy question, the one with um, uh, a booster as an alternative to tighter checks. And uh, we were thinking that because it's an alternative, uh, people could still turn to the titers. And so um, the titers being so much less expensive than the booster uh, could be seen as a positive thing that is, um, uh, that is good for um, equity, you know, for it and facilitates um, fairness, I guess, in, in for, for people who might not otherwise have, have gotten it. Um, the original comment that you made about the feasibility, I, I just wanted to make a quick clarification. So the the current three-dose series is 0, 7, and then a third dose, day 21 or day 28. So you could consider what we're proposing. I mean, we're calling it a booster, but you could consider it a flexible three-dose series if you wanted. And um, for the travel, someone who's traveling, for example, the, um, in our work group brought up the fact that, I mean, how are we going to guarantee that someone's going to come back for a tighter a year from now? You could schedule day three or day 21 as you would normally and just realize that that's not really essential to the travel that the person is doing right now. It's just to ensure long-term immunogenicity or alternatively, you could schedule that dose because it is flexible after they come back from their trip. And so they will have been protected for that trip, but then that uh, that booster dose that's scheduled for a week after they return would, uh, would just be facilitating long-term immunogenicity. So our, our thought was that it wouldn't be difficult to implement it because it's no no different really um, than what's currently recommended. If anything, it's it's a little bit more flexible and it, pro it produces more options, some of which could be um, preferred by people, like the tighter option. Um, did I answer your equity question by any chance, or is that still um, clear? You know, I understood the intent. I think I get confused because it looks like the checkbox says that equity is probably, I think it said probably reduced. Oh, uh, so, yeah, so uh, pro equity equity cons concerns would be reduced. Yeah. Equity concerns. Okay. So, it, it would be great for us to clarify that question. Okay. Yeah, it, it should be interpreted as equity. 
overall would be increased the, so that. I see. Yeah. Okay, so we could correct that. Yeah, yes. we, we can do that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And then just a comment that like the travelers are, um, I think I'm, I'm a little bit less worried about the travelers. I think I'm more worried about the students um, and other individuals who might uh, be exposed and um, they may or may not have consistency in the way that implementation uh, is. Yeah, it's it's true that because a lot of those professions don't have the the oversight of requiring that booster or titer check that we're relying on those individuals, especially if they're in private practice or something, they might have to you might have to rely on them to to keep track of that. But um, I wanted to point out that the current recommendation for those people when they work in terrestrial rabies regions is to get titers checked every two years. And and so this recommendation is 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 similar to that one in that we're asking them to to continue to follow up. Um, if anything, it's fewer fewer titers. I mean, not every two years, but just simply a one time a one time titer check or a one time um, straightaway booster. And and so in in the spirit of what's already on the books, this is not too much. This is not too much more of an. It's not more of an in inconvenience. If anything, it's better. Dr. Paling. All right. Thank you very much for sharing all that you, um, the work group has been discussing on this really important issue. Um, I wanted to, um, as we've had our conversation, wanted to clarify um, the, and talk a little bit about the intent because clearly there is the adherent. There's a lots of room to improve adherence for a fatal disease, and um, so streamlining the doses to reflect the newly available data is a great progress. And then it sounds, I believe the second thing that this is doing is the table is far simpler to under, understand. And then the third thing that's going on on the side is addressing the requirements. Is that a correct summary? Thank you. Yes, that's a perfect summary. Thank you. Um, before we talk about the phrasing of the two policy questions, I, I just wanted to ask again whether we really want to move uh, people to uh, policy question number four. Sharon, um, was there something that you wanted to say about that? Or Dr. Fry? I'm sorry, could you say uh, is, to address the policy question? Um, we had we had just talked about. I'm sorry. We had just talked about. Uh, I, I said this incorrectly. The the moving of of the short term people into a risk category number four. Um, it sounds yeah, I mean, like. I, right. So I mean, uh, the reason I thought they were there, uh, my understanding was, is because um, they have. Yes, they have short term exposure, but they have can have frequent short term exposures. And it would uh, be in line with uh, some of the other groups that are in that section three. And I, I would not uh, recommend moving them out of there. I'm talking about short-term uh, volunteers or animal workers. Yeah, I guess, I mean, my thought was that, and, and let me know what you think about this, but if they could have frequent exposures within three years, as long as the exposures, the risk for rabies ends at three years, they wouldn't need to um, have any boosters or titers checked. And so at, from that standpoint, it's true that if we move them into a new risk group, their own risk group, the column for long-term immunogenicity would then be not applicable. It would be NA because they don't have a risk for long-term immunogenicity after um, after three years. Um, so, but, but at the same time, I, I, I see what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, though, that their risk for rabies before three years is identical to the other people listed in risk group three. Um, the only difference is that they don't have that long-term risk, and so it is strange to put them in their own group. But, yes, I mean, but they could still be volunteering intermittently after three years. I mean, it's not like, okay, a stint in the three years are going to stop volunteering. A lot of people do trips. Um, maybe every couple years or so. So the immediate exposure is short term, but the long term, there's still long term risk should they venture out again, which many people do. Maybe I'm not expressing myself 
correctly. So, Dr. Fry, this is Amanda. What would you, where would you recommend they be in terms of the risk groups? Sorry, I, I, I would keep them where they are. Right. No. Okay, that's what we thought. Dr. Talbot, you want to uh, go forward? Dr. Talbot, your hand is up. I'm not sure if you have a question or a comment. Yes, I, I apologize. Someone stepped in my office. Um, yes, I, I did have a question. If you could go back to that slide with the numbers of prep. We're getting there. I know. I'm, I'm being patient. I can't, I can't complain because I'm the one that was um, interrupting. Okay. So you have here the list of categories, and I was trying to do the math in my head, which may be the issue, but it looks like there are about 20,000 people who we would think of as not travelers who would need to be re-immunized. Is it every three years? Because if that's the case, we should be looking at about 6,000 booster doses a year and you're only showing 500. Is that correct? Um, so this is per what's currently happening in the U.S. right now. Um, and so the people who are getting, so people are getting a three-dose series, a three-dose primary series, and then they're only getting a booster if um, the tighter checks that are done for people in the number one and number two risk groups, so basically the the very small number of people, the laboratorians on this list and the, the, the bat biologists and all, if those people are getting a tighter check at the six months or the two years uh, intervals, they would get a booster if their titer is under 0.5. But other folks, unless they're um, immunocompromised, would not have titers checked and would not be getting boosters. So can you tell me how many booster doses that we should anticipate in a year based on these numbers? Um, so the, the, the tighter booster situation is a one-time booster, so it's not every three years. It's either they get it, um, they get it before year three, which would amount to the same as the three-dose series. So it would, it would be less than what we're seeing here um, because this is about a three-dose primary series, and what, what we're proposing is a two-dose primary series and a third dose for a select number of people if they opt to, um, if, if they're not in the level one risk group, if they're not in the level two risk group, if they're not uh, short-term uh, short -term exposure people, and if they decided not to get a titer first to check to see if they needed a booster. So it would, it would, um, it would by our estimates, be a smaller number. Um, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Um, Blanton, did you want to clarify anything that I said or add any information? This is Dr. Wallace. Uh, I mean, I think we just all have to keep in mind that the provision of PEP pre-exposure of these boosters are not notifiable to the federal government, not reportable in most states either. So we are working off of a known number of distributed and likely used doses like you're seeing in this equation, and then Bureau of Labor Statistics and market uh, industry data to then try to figure out where these doses are likely going. We have done some calculations with the current schedule, and it looks like between five and 600 of these doses are probably booster doses each year. Um, I do not believe we've looked, we've tried to do these, this type of uh, basic mathematical models for what the new recommendations would look like. But Dr. Blanton, do you know if, if that was done? I, I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cotton, please. I was wondering if there would be any considerations for immunocompromised hosts who often need, um, which may compromise two to 4% of the US population and who may actually need more booster doses and whose titers may drop more quickly. Will there be anything in the fine print or um, any further clarification there? 
Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Cotton. I was uh, I didn't quite understand. Do, do you mean so? Right now, the way things stand are is that, is that immunocompromised people for both pre-exposure and post-exposure should have a titer checked after completion of the series in order to confirm that they have an appropriate titer response. For people who are not uh, immunocompromised, that is not done. A titer check. So. Um, it's already done, and it's hard to know how many booster doses someone will need before their titer will end up being over 0.5, the, the immunocompromised people. So we can't really say much beyond uh, continue to check titers until and boost accordingly until the titers are over the minimum antibody um, uh, cutoff. Um, it's it's just I from our anecdotal experience, some people will require only one, and some people will require several, and it'll be a very challenging case where there will be discussions about whether that altered immune compromised condition can be um, can be reversed. Like if they temporarily can be taken off of their medications that are making them immunocompromised, if truly the the risk for rabies is you know makes they you know for someone like this for pre exposure. Um, maybe they should be counseled to not work with rabies virus if, if they're having such difficulty mounting an appropriate antibody titer. Sure, sure. I guess it's, um, you know, when, when once they've achieved that antibody titer, they may drop more rapidly compared to normal hosts. So um, this is probably a discussion for a different time, and we definitely need more data in this fear because there's really um, very minimal data on immunocompromised hosts. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Long. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I thought I understood this. And then when Dr. Bell asked her question, I realized I don't. Could we see the um, slide that has the three categories on it, please? And then I, I think I could do the math, but I don't know what to put into the equation. Um, because I, I guess what I was thinking was, okay, so if we knew the numbers of people in all of these groups, we could, um, no, it actually, I guess that one wouldn't work. I was thinking of the one that had the blues on it as well. But um, wouldn't it? If there's a considerable number of people who would or should get the booster, wouldn't it make more sense to just give them the three doses uh, up to 21 days or give them the option of getting two if they really thought they weren't going to do that um, and just us think about it differently, that the third dose is not the third dose in your first series, but it, it, you're good to go for at least 10 years uh, and then not have to be worrying about all these categories or check in titers or, you know, check in titers again and then getting a boost if needed. But I, that may not make any sense if it's a very small number here um, that really actually would require uh, the third dose or the boost dose. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the table. I, I understand your question. I think your question is like this is so so intricate. There's so many different things. There's rabies risk categories, etc. This has actually been um, the way that. A rabies prep has been uh, considered for previous ACIP recommendations too. So we didn't actually recreate the fact that there are different risk groups based on whether they have recognized or unrecognized exposures. Um, the primary series is, has always been the same for all of these risk groups. Where things change is for research, for laboratorians, for, for people who have unrecognized risks for rabies exposures. So basically for the number one and the number two risk groups, we would want to further ensure that their titers remain over 0.5. So we know with time that their titers are going to, anyone who gets a primary vaccine series, that typically their titers are going to drop off a little bit. And um, that does not mean that they would not mount an anamnestic response um, when they, if they were to have an exposure. So um, one of our work group members actually has, has um, led one of, a lot of the work related to the an antibody titer levels and said that um, 
she, in her experience, there's been situations where someone has an undetectable antibody titer, but then they boost. So it's, it's, it's like for the, for the number three risk group, they only have recognized exposures. And so even if their antibody titer level was much lower than 0.5, we have confidence that they would boost um, and that they would get post-exposure prophylaxis. For the people in the number one and the number two risk groups, we're not confident that they would always get post-exposure prophylaxis or that it would be given as quickly as they would potentially need it. For for example, the, the research laboratorians who are dealing with high concentration of rabies um, virus. And so for those people, we would have to check titers frequently just for that additional peace of mind of ensuring that their titers stay longer for higher, even though the 0.5 is, is really just a surrogate for, for the ability to mount an anamnestic response. It's not true. You know, like we know that much lower titer levels um, results in anamnestic t- uh, uh, responses. Um, so this complicated, intricate thing of, of, of looking at risk categories has, has all, always existed for the ACIP recommendations for rabies, where we have made changes is, um, is that we, we ended up separating people a little bit differently from the 2008 ACIP recommendations. We consolidated the diagnostic laboratorians with the other laboratorians in risk group one, and we pulled out all the veterinarians and um, animal care workers and, and uh um, and those people who, who work with animals in terrestrial rabies region and combine them with the, the number three risk group. So we actually took people out of the higher risk group and put them in the lower risk group instead. Um, and there are no travelers in this group three? No, the travelers are listed there in group three in the, um, the middle. Do you, do you see group three? It says animal care professionals in non-terrestrial rabies regions, students. Blah, blah, but persistent groups. travelers. Now I'm thinking about short-term travelers. Yeah, so that would be under, under, under short-term animal care professionals and persons without sustained risk for rabies. And so those people would get no booster or tighter and no addition. Yeah, those would get no, no booster or tighter. I think it would be helpful for you to put... Travelers in there because the rest of them you're you're talking all about professionals and students and spelunkers and but the casual traveler kind of gets lost. So I would assume that answer to my question is that the vast majority of the rabies vaccine that's pre-exposure prophylaxis that's given is in travelers who are short-term travelers, and so they wouldn't require sustained and they wouldn't require boosters, so it probably wouldn't make sense to give them all three doses from the get-go that would include their booster. Yeah, I've just uh, we're just pulling up one slide to to show you. This is this slide that I I've been showing you. All these blue and, and yellow was mostly for our discussion to uh, because it, it's such a noisy kind of um, table that we've created. But um, for the actual ACIP write up, this noisier table um, is going to be the table that is in the actual document, and you can see travelers under the number three risk group. Uh, travelers have their own section here, and we refer them to the, the CDC Travelers Health destination Thank pages. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Um, so, I, I, going back to, over to the um, number three risk group, when, I, when you had the slide reminder proposed changes in number three risk group, then under long-term immunogenicity, um, it says tighter ones at two years after primary series or booster ones no sooner than tw- day 21 and no later than three years. But actually in the other slide that you had before, that, it, that would not be included in that, um, you know, the ones that have, um, you know, the intermittent, um, you know, the, let's see. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, to- uh, I understand what you're saying. So what we had, I-, I think your proposal of putting them into risk group four probably makes sense. We had initially, there was an asterisk up here under long-term immunogenicity and a footnote that said long-term immunogenicity is only needed if um, if this group of people has a risk beyond three years. And so that would have taken care of it. But um, does that does that help, Dr. Sanchez? But But I see what you're saying, that it's just easier to put them in their own risk group. 
Yeah, I just want to clarify that because when I look at the your other side with proposed changes, um, that group then what we're going to be recommending is that that group also get tighter once after two years after primary series or booster. So kind of. I see, you know, I see what you're don't... saying. So I think then you're you're correct. What we need to do is that so the the policy the policy the the recommendation the way it's phrased says for those with persistent or sustained. I think the word sustained is used, and so that was intended to just pull out the um, the people with risk for th uh, during up to three years. But um, yeah. it sounds like maybe that word is not enough to clarify that uh, short term travelers should. Um, should not be included in that. So I guess I'm supportive of, of pulling out the short-term folks into into risk group number four. Um, yeah, I just think that there's um, that there's that it's a separate group and separate separate recommendations and lumping them in there. We're gonna and even in, on this table that you have shown up, um, travelers there will be performing activities. Um, it just anyway. I think yeah. So this is Sharon. I would agree with that if we put the um, definition back in there with, with the asterisk that, that alludes to or says specifically, uh, Agam, what you said about one, one to three years or up to three years. Yeah. So, so Dr. Fry, I, I think that what uh, Dr. Sanchez is suggesting is just to reduce any um, rely, need to rely on like a footnote or something like that, that maybe separating those people with the short term uh, risk into their own number four risk category, which I which I think we can definitely do, and in that case, it will be very clear that the number three risk group is 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 only people who have sustained risk for rabies. Yes, I mean I think I think that can I agree with you. One, two, I think it can be nicely handled with um, better uh, language, as you just mentioned, better definition or footnote or whatever it takes. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Uh, yeah, I, um, in follow-up to this discussion, that's exactly uh, uh, what I was suggesting, um, because I think that uh, sustained or recurrent more than three years fits into um, the third group, and then there we're talking about short-term with unsustained or not recurrent uh, are the ones that don't that are NA for long-term immunogenicity. So I'm glad that uh, we're pulling them out. Uh, it'll be more clear clinically, I believe. Ms. McNally. Thank you. Will the vaccine information statement make any mention of the titers issue? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you mean the package insert? No, I mean the information sheet that the vaccinated people would receive where, so if I'm looking at this, they get their primary dose and later, are, are they, how, do, how does the consumer know that they need to have titers checked other than a conversation with the provider? I actually don't know the answer to that. I have to defer to our ACIP leadership on whether or not there is a paper handout that's given after um, a two-dose primary series that should remind the patient that they need to get a titer or a booster in, in, in two years or in one year. Hi, everyone. This is Amanda. So VIS statements um, are not required for um, to give to persons um, after um, adult vaccine, after adult vaccines that are not uh, in, in the uh, that's concluded in the Vaccine Injury Compensation Act. Uh, however, we do have VIS statements available for rabies vaccine. Um, and the Immunization Action Coalition has um, information for patients as well about uh uh, all vaccines. I don't specifically recall if it if it tells you to come back, um, but that sh is typically um, we we can double check on that. Thank you, Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Uh, if travelers are going to be broken out into their own risk category number four. And it potentially, as I, as I understand this conversation, could impact what is in the far right column, the long-term immunogenicity. 
potentially making an NA for that column in this newly created row of travelers for number for a number four risk category. I come back to my my well the concerns maybe that were were implicit in my questioning earlier that that number one children probably are at higher risk of exposure um, as travelers to international settings than would be adults simply because they don't have the same judgment than an adult does. They're smaller, they're lower to the ground, they're less likely to be able to defend themselves, and therefore I would presume are more likely to be mauled more thoroughly than an, an adult would. And if it's NA for the long-term immunogenicity where it removes the opportunity to get a what's called a booster 21 days after, um, that, that would be concerning to me. Then you would be limiting the child who I would suggest is at higher risk than the adult traveler uh, to only two doses. Whereas as currently proposed, it's two plus you can get a third at 21 days. The AAP has not considered this fully as the Committee on Infectious Disease uh, uh, yet. We will be deliberating on it later this year. I would suspect that could be a concern for uh, for the AAP. Yeah. So just to clarify, it's not all travelers that we're we're proposing would be pulled into risk group number four. It's only people who do not have sustained risk for rabies. So whether they're travelers, whether they're animal care workers, whether they're part time people working with animals, for anyone who does not have risk for rabies beyond three years, it would be NA for for. I mean, they wouldn't. They don't have long-term risk, so they don't need to have pre-exposure prophylaxis beyond three years. And so it's only for those people. But children who, like, for example, are moving abroad, are living with their parents abroad, whatever, uh, are, are, are planning on going with their parents to, um, to developing countries frequently, they would still fall under risk category number three and would still have the tighter booster as the, the recommendation. So which, what is being voted on today would include... Those those child travelers that have risk for rabies beyond three years. I, I, I think I follow that. I, I, I still I don't know that that really addresses my concern. I'm thinking about a child maybe who's uh, going to see grandparents in a foreign country uh, that his his or her parents moved from uh, prior to his birth, um, and it may not be frequent or repetitive visits back to that country. Yet that child still would be at risk for uh, perhaps higher risk for exposure. And if a physician wanted to give three doses as currently would be the situation, instead of two doses to move that one time child visitor to a category four and have NA in the far right column would remove the opportunity to give a third dose prior to travel. Yeah, no, for, th for those people, I'm sorry. For those people that we think might have long-term risk, and it sounds like the, per the person that you're describing who might be visiting his grandparents multiple times over the next 10 years, they would fall under risk group number three. D David, this is uh, this Jose. Uh, so let me ask this question. Are, are you concerned that the two-dose regimen would not sufficiently protect a child um, in that first three years be because... Um, their their exposure would be so much greater than an adult, and and as you pointed out, I mean they're being mauled um, at a, at, a, at a higher you know a, a, lot, a greater degree than would an adult. Is, is is that your concern, or or outside of that three year period? Uh, my concern, is, and this is me speaking just for myself, uh, not for the academy. My concern is that. It's within that three-year period of time. It's that we, we have one observational study that looked, I believe it was said, two weeks after um, the two-dose or three-dose series was completed at what the antibody titers are. We do not know, do not know what the decay is. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have real world experience with this approach. Um, and it concerns me when the disease is 100% lethal. Right, okay, so, so just to, let, me, let me see if I can summarize this. So, so the issue then, is, as, as I understand it from Dr. Kimberlin, is that a two-dose regimen would not provide sufficient antibodies to protect a child that, would be mal that we would expect to be mauled at a greater degree because he's smaller, bites around the head and neck than an adult would. H have I summarized that correctly, David? Well, I would, I would, I would uh, soften the word would 
um, would not would imply we actually know. My point is we don't know. Very, um, the studies have very been good, done, and, and so that would, be, that, that would be my issue. Yeah, okay, so I, I understand the question now. So D Dr. Kimberlin, we actually, um, it was the data that I, I shared with you about pediatric patients. We, we did a systematic review of the response to pediatric patients to rabies vaccines, and they always had um, as good a response as healthy adults, and typically a much more robust response, a much higher titer. And um, as far as long-term like decay and all, uh, I'll ask Dr. Blanton to weigh in on that. My, my um, understanding is that the decay is, I mean, the higher that your, your titer is, the longer it will stay high. And that because children tend to have a higher titer than healthy adults, that it would stay higher longer. So um, my understanding was that it's it's, it's, it's really that children are, are, are more protected, potentially. But Dr. Blinton, can you correct me or, or clarify, please? So, so yeah, I, think, I mean, I, I think... No, so go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, who's speaking? I'm sorry, I didn't recognize the voice. Dr. Blinton. Oh, yeah. Sorry, this is no, a, Dr. Blinton, please, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, so I, I think there, the evidence that's out there is certainly consistent that children have you know, the similar or, or possibly somewhat more robust um, response to rabies vaccine series in general. Um, I think in this situation, you know, it's, it's important to consider that we're not, you know, we're not proposing that these vaccines are protective. If free pills have an exposure, there's still an expected post-exposure prophylaxis regimen that's given. And, you know, there's very robust data throughout the years maybe not specifically the data in children for a 07 schedule, but there have been studies done, um, you know, with two dose or reduced reduce dose schedules in children, um, you know, that there would be no reason to believe that under, you know, normal circumstances that a child who's had at least two doses of vaccine wouldn't respond robustly with an amnestic response to a, to a post-exposure prophylaxis, a two dose series after an exposure, um, even in the event uh, you know, severe mauling. I mean, this this happens, you know, on a frequent basis around the world. Um, you know, so the certainly the specific, you know, say a controlled trial specifically to this population, specifically to these doses, we don't have a large amount of data. But what we know about response to rabies vaccine in general wouldn't suggest that this would be, you know, a concern. Thank you for that comment. So let me let me ask specifically. The, the voting members to comment on this concern that Dr. Kimberlin has. Um, Dr. Daly, your, your hand is up. Were you, were you planning on commenting about that or did you have a different comment? I had a different comment, so I can hold that. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Long, your hand is up. Is it a different comment or a comment on, uh, on the question that I just posed to the group? Comment on the question. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Comment please. on this. Comment, go, go, please. It is a comment on this question. Please go, please go, go forward. Yes. Um, I think Dr. Kimberlin brings up a very good point. Um, you know, there's a difference in among ages of children and what a immediate antibody response means and what it means about what your net, your cellular response means or what your anamnestic response means. I, I, I'm not as uh, comfortable as I would have been before he asked that question, purely because of lack of data and um, risk for children and because of the disease we're talking about. So I, I wonder, in the absence of data, I, I don't think 200 children who have an average age of wasn't 10, that's not the group I'm thinking about that might have a different response. It's the much younger ones. So I wonder if we might not pull children out of this recommendation for prep, this prep for two dose. Yeah, so Dr. Long, I, um, we did this systematic review of, of, of children. And I, I mean, it was actually when I was briefing you to, um, on Friday just to bring you up to speed on um, what the work group had discussed. There was extra slides. Okay, well, I, I, it sounds like we want to hear from others and then I can get back um, to that answer. All right, um, Dr. Talbot, do you, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask, offer comment? I actually have a similar point, and it's 
the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, I'm worried about older adults who are not considered immunocompromised but are likely immunosenesced. Do we have data on those? Uh, 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 just a second here. Let me see if we can... Yeah, so unless they have an immune-compromising condition, uh, we found that the elderly um, mounted an appropriate titer response after um, the, the series that we recommended. If they, have, um, if they have altered immunity, then, of course, they fall under the immunocompromised recommendations. Dr. Bell, please. Oh, thank you. I, I think to this point about children, uh, two issues. First is, as Dr. Kimberlin has pointed out, um, I think some of the other interventions that we tell travelers, for example, um, to implement to avoid uh, rabies exposures are obviously um, potentially not relevant to children. That is, they're not as likely to be able to protect themselves. And, and certainly in a scenario of a child that goes to visit their grandparents in an endemic area, Again, we're not 100. We, we don't know that they're going to be able to take those uh, pr precautions, and so that makes me feel like it is potentially a, a, a particularly a different group. Second thing, I think, from the perspective of um, you know uh, these small immunogenicity studies, I, I'm not sure that, um, as people are saying, that they, they're actually uh, enough data, and we have to remember that what we're doing is trying to uh, simplify. Because we have data to suggest that the simplification is fine, perhaps we don't have the data in children. And a uh, third point, even though I just said two, is that I am concerned about the ACIP weighing in in this arena um, when one of our closest partners, that being the AP and the Red Book Committee, as Dr. Kimblin says, have not had an opportunity to, to review these data on their own, and I would be very unhappy with an ACIP recommendation, which was not consistent with an AAP recommendation. I know that sort of thing does happen. but So for all of those reasons, I think it is prudent to perhaps um, delay at least um, a recommend the, applying these recommendations to children until um, perhaps the work group is able to have a um, more robust discussion with partner organizations and um, uh, just perhaps consider this a little bit further. Thank you for those comments. So uh, I, I think that, that for the reasons you've articulated well, so well, is that um, is, we should probably pull these, the children out of this PICO question um, at this time. I, I, for the record, I will go on record saying that I think the two-dose regimen is fine um, for reasons that Dr. Blanton has discussed. Um, and and it's used worldwide. So, um, but but I think we need to get um, the COID the AAP on board, uh, or or not on board if if, if that is their feeling. And I, uh, Dr. Maldonado, I see your hand is up, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't want to uh, interrupt because I realized that Dr. Kimberlin was carrying on quite a robust discussion. But um, it is true that the COID has not had a chance, an opportunity to really review any of these data. And in fact, the pediatric data were only recently shown to us, um, just this, a couple of us from the COID. So we, um, we, we're not, we don't, we, we propose to present these data to the COID, but we would not be able to make a recommendation at this time and couldn't guarantee one way or another whether we could harmonize. I mean, I'm not saying we wouldn't. I just can't say at this time until the COID would meet and, and have a discussion with the indicator. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Ms. McNally, your hand is still up. I just want to make sure I'm not skipping you. Or you have another comment. No, oh, I'm going to put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to slide number 16. Uh, I think we're ready to discuss the... On the second presentation, slide 16, second presentation. <laughs> for the um, policy question wording. And I want to thank everyone for such a robust uh, discussion. 
so the uh, proposed recommendation for vote is listed, is, is shown there on your computer, um, and I will uh, simply read it to you all. So uh, ACIP recommends a two dose, uh, zero and seven days, intramuscular rabies vaccine series in persons for whom rabies vaccine pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP is indicated. Um, and uh, the work group interpretation is that of uh, work group preference for this intervention. Now, we just discussed that uh, we would take the children under 18 out of this discussion. So this recommendation would be for individuals greater than or equal to 18 years of age. And they're typing it in as we speak. Great. All right. Um, so uh, is there any discussion on this at this point before we have uh, motions? Dr. Bernstein. I just wanted to clarify, is it 19 and above? Uh, the child and adolescent schedule goes through 18 and they, then it's 19 on up, or are we making a distinction there? I would say it's 18 or greater at this point, but again, Dr. Long. Uh, I, I don't think I want to weigh 18 to 19, but, um, I, I, you know, I wonder if it would be too tricky to go down to 12. I, I think there's absolutely no reason to think a 12-year-old and an 18-year-old or 19-year-old would would have different immunogenicity. It really is the young ones under five that we're really not so sure about and why we have to do studies to make these. But if it's a matter also of considering harmonization, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics certainly uh, has a purview between 12 and 18, and I wouldn't want to um, cross that bridge. So I guess I'd like to hear from Bonnie Maldonado or David Kimberlin about if, if they think it's cleanest to do um, 18 or to maybe consider going down to 12. So let me, let me um, take Chairman's prerogative on this and, and, and interject at this point. Um, I, I think that for sake of, of expediency and, and coming to a vote today, it may be best to say 18 and older and allow the AAP and the COID to then parse the age difference if necessary. Um, that is my suggestion. I, I, as you all know, I, I, I offer few comments because I don't want to shift the, the discussion, but um, you know, we've, we've been discussing this for quite a while, um, and, and at the risk of, of um, uh, circling after our tails, um, it, this may be one way to expeditiously call the vote to the question, the greater question at hand, over. I'm failing. Yes, thank you, and I very much appreciate the uh, modification and agree with this. I um, wanted to raise the question. One of the conversations we've had is that immunosuppressed persons are different. So do we want to add in immunocompetent persons? Uh, I think uh, our executive director is running to a microphone to add a comment here. No? Okay. She's adding it to the text on yes. the screen, okay. yes. Good. Yeah. Yes, we can add that. We can add it so it's ex explicit that immuno that the person has to be immunocompetent. So, so we will add that to, to be explicit. So I'll read the wording as it is now. Um, so ACIP recommends a two-dose, zero and seven days intramuscular rabies vaccine series in immunocompetent persons greater than or equal to 18 years of age for whom rabies vaccine pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP 
is indicated. Are there any other comments? I see your hand up, Dr. Uh, Ms. Bata, please go ahead. I would um, move that we accept the proposed recommendation for both. Thank you for that motion. Uh, do I have a second? Um, I think I'm, Dr. Glee's hand came up. No, I'm sorry. Dr. Paling's hand came up next um, before Dr. Lee's. Is it was it was it up, Dr. Paling, to make a? It, it was, and I wanted to second Ms. Bata's um, recommendation. Okay. Is, is there any other discussion or comment at this point? I see none. Okay. So, so this will be our recommendation. Um, we, we will have a, a public comment session next. Oh, I, I, a second, please. The second language. Sorry, second language. Forgive me. There, side 26, please. They're flashing me signals here. That <laughs> not interpreting. The masks don't help. <laughs> okay. So, um, second uh, recommendation for wording. ACIP recommends an intramuscular booster dose of rabies vaccine as an alternative, alternative uh, to a tighter check no sooner than day 21, but no later than three years after the second dose prep series for those who have sustained, uh, uh, sustained an elevated, is it and or and elevated? And. And elevated risk uh, for um, only recognized rabies exposures, i.e. those uh, in risk category number three of rabies prep recommendations table, close parenthesis. Any comments? Dr. Bell. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, make a, a comment about this proposed uh, recommendation and actually also the previous one, and that's about um, the implementation issues, which have been raised by a number of people. Um, some of the uh, financial barriers, what insurance pays for, what employers pay for, what people are doing, how the recommendations are being implemented. These are all things that I think are um, especially challenging for uh, certainly, first of all, they're not the purview. ACIP has only very limited ability to influence those kinds of issues. And for these non-routine uh, vaccines, um, it's, uh, it's oftentimes um, difficult for, um, for CDC to actually monitor some of this. So I, I would like to just sort of um, encourage, uh, especially some of our ex officio partner organizations, that may actually have a lot of ability or more ability to address and follow some of these implementation issues um, to really uh, try to do that. And also, I would uh, suggest that the CDC website really be pristine, perfectly clear, and very user-friendly on these issues because um, they are quite, uh, uh, it's quite complicated and challenging and uh, people definitely will be using the CDC website. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Yes, I just wanted to just um, comment whether we need to add the 18 years of age or over and immunocompetent. And also as a secondary comment, again, I hate to go back to the risk groups three or four or whatever, but i.e. those in risk category three also includes short-term animal care professionals and without sustained risk. So I think, Dr. Sanchez, it sounds like what, uh, what we've discussed is that anyone who has short-term exposures, whether it's travelers uh, who have no expected exposures after three years and also animal care workers, that they would move into risk group number four. So everybody in number three would be people who have risk beyond three years. Um, and then as far as uh, changing the language, um, it sounds like, yes, we should, since we're only now talking about uh, people 18 years of age and older, and we're only talking about immunocompetent people, we, sh um, we are inserting language right now onto the, onto the screen to insert um, uh, persons 
greater than and equal to 18 years of age who are immunocompetent. And you can see it being added there. Dr. Daly, I, I think you had other comments to make. I'm sorry if I jumped you um, during the previous discussion. Please, please go ahead and make any comments you wish. Oh no, not 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 at all. Because I, I was going to bring up a, a set of points closely related to what Dr. Bell just said, and then we we had our discussion of of pediatric consideration. So I, I put my hand down, but I think. I think we just to acknowledge that um, there's a relationship between the clarity of ACIP recommendations and then what adherence looks like and then our ability to sort of recognize barriers to adherence and then ultimately there's a relationship between adherence and sort of disease prevention and I think the part that we could control is is in addition to evidence review it's sort of the clarity of of, of what we put out in the public and and because I think there is a relationship there I agree strongly with Dr. Bell that sort of the the extent to which we can be clear about this and then the extent to which we can monitor and advocate with with uh, liaisons about how it's implemented is is going to ultimately achieve um, as much disease prevention as possible over Thanks, Dr. Daly and Dr. Bell. We hear, hear your, you loud and clear and completely agree, and uh, we will uh, do everything we can to ensure this is clear. It is, um, as you say, incredibly complicated and really important. So not to start a discussion, um, we do have a public uh, comment session at, two, at 12.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, um, and I want to give people time to grab something quick to eat. Um, so we're going to end discussion after these next two questions or comments. Uh, Dr. Middleman first, and then uh, followed by uh, Dr. Long, please. Hi, thank you. This is Amy Middleman. I, this probably goes without saying, but I just want to clarify based on language. People keep saying that risk, that the short term will move into risk category four, but I just want to clarify that does mean that risk category four becomes risk category five, correct? They're not treated the same. The current risk category four will then be risk category five. That's We're correct. Not moving. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank yes. You. The general population is always its own category that is number five at this point, based on what we just discussed. Thank you so much. Dr. Long, please. Uh, two comments. The first is. I just don't know that we should add the 18 and over in this particular recommendation because I'm thinking that it might disenfranchise some children who might want to have or have counted this booster dose. I don't know why we would need to put the, the this in this age with this age group. Um, it either wouldn't apply if we continue to give three doses to children, or it could apply and you would want it to happen. Uh, so that's one thought. So people who can understand these things a little better than I probably would understand if it's better to put in or take out the 18 in this particular one. Um, the next thing is, I, I, I don't know, is this what the recommendation will actually say? I, I think it's very Poorly, not poorly, but difficult to understand how the way it's written. Can you have two sentences that the first clarifies who you're talking about, and then the second says that that booster dose can occur at, from day 21, but no later than three years after the two dose series. Um, and I think it's still difficult to have this only recognized rabies in here unless somebody understands that there's a whole other higher level of protection of people who might have unrecognized. Um, so I, I, I guess somebody can answer. Are these the actual words of what the recommendation will be? Or is this just for our understanding? Because we could have an understanding about it, but this would not be the right way to to say this if we were presenting it to the public. So in general, the vote is for the recommendation presented. There can be minor wordsmithing performed after the vote by the, um, by, by the uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, outside of, of, of the vote of the ACIP members. So um, we, we could um, tinker with this 
uh, before the vote, um, and then have a motion uh, after the after the, the public comment se session. So let's let's that, do that. Why don't we do that? Why don't we tinker with it after the and present something after the public um, uh, comment session section? Excuse me. Um, uh, does that sound fair, uh, Dr. Long? That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, again, as I said, I, uh, not to stifle discussion, but I do want to give you a chance to have uh, to, to have something to eat or to stretch your legs or to uh, uh, do other things. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll adjourn here for 15 minutes and then readjourn for the public comment session. Thank you very much for a robust discussion.